My name is Nick Wong. I'm a professor at University of Wisconsin Whitewater. I'm Anthony Eric. Marasco. Oh, sorry. Oh, you go. go ahead. Go. Yeah. <laughs> I was just gonna say I'm Anthony Marasco. I'm a um, professor, uh, assistant professor of music technology at the uh, University of Texas Rio Grande Valley. Eric Sheffield. I um, actually between places right now. I'm starting at Miami University in the fall in music, and they also have an emerging technology in business and design department. So I'll be split in the two departments. Um, starting in uh, in September. Great, and we've been working on this tool, Colab Hub, for over a year now, and it's gone through many iterations. And we've been using it for musical performances, uh, installations, web-based interfaces, and we'll be sharing examples, working through setup today, and later on we'll break into smaller groups and see if we can collaborate on some some demo uh, collaborations, either making sound using web interfaces and, and the like. Um, and we will be pointing you to an, a set of example package that we're going to be working through for the workshop. Um, and uh, I think Eric is going to help us go through that. Yeah, sorry, I put the link in the Slack channel. It's now in the chat here. Um, I, think, I think we want to give a little bit more background too on what, um, you know, sort of where we came from with this in terms of uh, all three of us have have a music background primarily, and came to um, came to this telematic remote performance stuff, to this collab of networking stuff, you know, as musicians primarily learning sort of as we went, learning about different networking technologies and topologies and all those kinds of things. And so we really saw this tool as uh, we wanted to create collab as something that was like for our past selves, for for when we were younger and we were primarily musicians that just knew like some stuff in Max. Um, had no experience with web audio yet, had hardly any experience with, um, uh, with you know, networking. And we thought, you know, it was, it would be, it would have been nice to have this tool back when, when we were first interested in those things. Um, so we, we, before I lead you through sort of the, the download and setup of our uh, file resources, I wanted, we wanted to ask you guys to just tell us a little bit about what your experiences or interests have been so far in, you know, telematic music or networking performance or any sort of network uh, media or art. Yeah, feel free to um, unmute yourself and chime in and let us know a little bit about your backgrounds. Maybe I can say something then? Sure, yeah, Thanks. welcome, Peter. Yeah. Can you hear me well? It's very windy, Netherlands summertime. It's amazing. <laughs> sounds fine, yeah. Yeah, it sounds great. Cool. Hi, Pedro. Um, I am studying composition at the Royal Conservatory in The Hague in the Netherlands. I'm going to go to master's next year. Uh, and uh, this past year, because of, of the pandemic, like I was quite inspired by it. And I really started delving into network music and just like network telematic internet art creation, which is very interesting. Um, I've done some stuff, you know, about like the philosophy of like internet and connection and blah, 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 and all these things. Um, like the sort of like piece that I did that really started off was a piece based on the code from Twitch Plays Pokemon from like 2014, mm. <laughs> which people were able to like input words, keywords, and I would do something. So what I did, for example, is that like people could input some sound related words and that would go to some Python code, which I have no idea how it works, direct it to Max. Max did some internal magic and that would spit out back into a Twitch live stream. Um, and then, yeah, and then from there on, just like really started um, delving more and more into like network and communication and participatory systems. And uh, yeah, I guess that's, and my whole master research will be about that for the next, for the next two years. That's a very broad um, description, I guess. Awesome. Yeah. It sounds like you've got some background you, in that. Do you know, is, uh, I, I just know he used to be in The Hague. Do you know Henry Vega? Henry Vega, I've heard of him. I actually talked to my teacher, my teacher Giannis. I think he yeah. was his teacher. He's yeah. Uh, yeah, his teacher, I believe, or something like that. Yeah, I'm not sure where he is. I know, I know he was in the Hague for a while. He may still be. Uh, I think he's, he's got like a family. In the Netherlands, isn't he yeah. like married to also a composer, Kasha? Yes. From Poland? Yeah. Kasha was yep. in my final exam uh, three weeks ago, actually. <laughs> nice. Great. Yeah. He's he he. Uh, I I've met him a couple times. He we did some collaborations. Uh, one of his 
one of his old buddies from when he was in grad school is a good uh. friend of mine. And so he like, we collaborated on some like remix stuff at some point together and I've seen him perform live a few times and I figured he's probably, you know, pretty active still around there. I mean, I've never heard of him. But I've only been here for two years anyway. Yeah. But, uh, I actually have him like on an open tab to check out his stuff after Giannis nice. told me. So yeah, nice. we'll need to go check. Cool. Awesome. Well, welcome. Thanks for coming today. And Luis, you want to tell us a bit about yourself? Sure. Um, uh, I'm at uh, the conference here because uh, I'm also doing a workshop uh, tomorrow. It's the, the live streaming as an instrument one. Oh, awesome. Um, yeah, so I, I've got quite a bit of interest in um, in the kind of stuff that uh, the Collab Hub uh, project I guess touches on. Um, uh, I built a platform that was originally called Noise Script. I uh, presented it last year at NIME um, and also at Next Festival, which is like an alternative music festival in Slovakia. Uh, recently, I've been working with um, uh, an artist institution called Vasilka Kitchen. Uh, just getting sort of funding to develop it further. Um, and uh, currently it's under the um, sort of new name called Rebellion. And uh, it's sort of evolved from being a, a prototype into um, a bit more of a mature um, platform, which I'm, I've only just soft launched it so far, but uh, I'll be able to give people a bit more of an introduction to it tomorrow. and. It's, it started as mostly focused on uh, creating uh, like aleatoric Cajun kind of music. Um, uh, and mostly fulfilling the, what I wanted to be able to just do live streaming, um, sort of uh, non-linear aleatoric jamming from browser to browser without really needing to have run a server on anyone's computer. So uh, it, it uses all kinds of uh, encoding and decoding in the browser. And um, yeah, uh, I, I guess if anyone's interested, I can show you later on how that works. Maybe we can somehow connect the Collab Hub and that platform together or something, get something interesting going. But um, yeah, and I'm basically in my own time make sort of noise art that that's mostly my sort of field is noise harsh noise sorry what recording was, stuff what was the name of that platform again that you're doing uh, i'll just link to it here yeah that'd be awesome and i, and I think we are really interested in in getting to not just know both of your backgrounds but to see where you think collab up could fit in your practice and how you think Collabo could be enhanced as well. That's one of the great things about these workshops is, is getting this kind of feedback loop going between everyone. Definitely. So, uh, well, thank you guys both. Um, I, as I said, I posted the link to the um, GitHub repo in there, in the chat there. And we don't want to assume, um, you know, part of our, it sounds like obviously, you know, Luis, you're developing this platform yourself. And Pedro, you've had some experience with, you know, different different techno uh, network technologies and things like that and are, and are doing some work with that now. So we don't want to assume uh, what you do or don't know, which is just to say we we really tried to make like we've we gave a similar workshop at NIME with this with this information, with this content. Um, and, you know, if you're comfortable just cloning the GitHub repo, obviously, you know how to do that. Uh, and if you're not, you can just it's set up so that you can just download the zip file and um, uh, and work as you know as it's presented here um we're going to be at least doing some demonstrations in max and pure data if you already have those installed great if you don't um there are links in the um, repository to wherever there is current um where you know whatever their current release is uh max even though it's a commercial product has a 30-day trial so if you just if, you, if you're not a max user and you just want to follow along with some of the uh content and the demonstrations we're going to do you know you can download that, get that started now. Um, so we will obviously go over this content of the GitHub repo in more detail. Uh, just to kind of give a brief overview, 
of our goals for today. So we won't, you know, we won't spend all our time looking at slides because that's not really what workshops should be about necessarily. But uh, obviously, we all introduced each other, gave you an overview sort of what uh, of of the, the resources that we're going to be looking at and what we're going to be doing. Um, I'll start off today. These breaks actually are probably in the wrong spots because these were from our old timing. So we'll probably do the first three things and then take a break and then do the next three things and be done. Um, so ignoring where the breaks are put. Well, I'll start off setting up the Collab Hub environment with you guys and doing some quick uh, overview of getting it set up in PD, getting it set up in, in Max, looking at it through uh, uh, a web-based interface and, and connecting it with web audio. Um, then we'll go more in depth into sort of the protocols behind Collab Hub um, so that you can sort of freely send messages to the server, receive them from the server, and um, you know use them to communicate with people in other platforms and, and in other places. Um, and depending upon sort of the time that we have towards the end, we figured we could spend some time then also helping you incorporate uh, Collab Hub into your current projects and or see how it would work with what you're doing. Maybe we can put together some quick demonstrations and like try out some new, uh, a new like short uh, composition sort of like at the end of this, we could try to like send things to each other and see how that works. Um, and then of course, anytime, feel free to stop, ask questions. We'd like to hear from you at the end after you see how this all works. We want to hear from you about what sort of features you'd like to see, other feedback that you have in terms of the future direction for this. We're, we're certainly in a place now where it's uh, Collab Hub is very much a usable product. We use it every week for our live streams. It's been used by some laptop ensembles and, and in art installations. But of course, it's still, you know, it's we're continuing to work on it and make improvements to it. So we want to hear, um, hear from you at the end about what else you think we could do with it. Um, OK, so Nick, you want to take yeah. it away? Sure. So at the heart of it, Collab Hub is a server-based messaging tool for sharing data. Uh, we wanted to create a tool that allowed us to send things like control values from maybe like a multi-slider controller or being able to trigger different types of events or let each other know the start of events. And um, we first started out with Macs and then we've expanded it to other devices and uh, creative applications, but the heart of it was basically those two things, being able to say, okay, we're starting a new section and then maybe able to control some, some built-in instruments that Eric had made or an instrument that Tony had made. And we could send those types of data to each other and sort of play each other instruments or alter some, some parameters along the way. Uh, we have servers that are mainly in the United States and we've been talking about uh, putting some some up in Europe so that the latency is, is lower. And we're working on separate libraries that include things like Pure Data, Arduino, uh, Web, obviously, um, uh, Unity, Game Engine. And so things like that, we're, we're making client um, applications that will interface with the Colab Hub server. I, I just want to mention really quick because you you know the name Max is in the name of the workshop and and as Nick mentioned that was kind of where we started and a lot of that just had to do with the fact that Node.js Max I can't remember if it was version seven or eight started supporting Node.js out of the box and so that sort of got our gears turning of like okay what could we do with this and then of course uh, this was back in I guess like February and March of last year and then of course the pandemic started right after that so we literally gave like our first demonstration workshop of of these ideas in March at a festival called Moxonic. And then like a week later, the airports, or airport, I guess the airports never shut down, but like a week later, things started shutting down and we were kind of like, okay, well, we should probably see this through. This seems like the right time to do this. Right, and so like uh, as part of that development over the last year, we had to start making some choices about like what is Collab Hub going to be and what's it gonna do and what should it not do or, or what do we feel has already been done and maybe not to focus its development on. So this is our slide of like, okay, here's what we have kind of said Collab Hub isn't at this moment, right? And again, we wanna hear from everybody to see if you feel these things are, are really needed um, inside of the same ecosystem. But right now, as Nick mentioned, it's a data sharing tool, right? We've got tons of ways to tag that data, to process that data, to send different types of data, but it's not an audio sharing tool. So we don't have anything open like through WebRTC to stream audio. Um, there are a number of platforms to do that. And we, 
as performers have used a ton of different things like you know yesterday we were all on zoom for the conference we've used uh discord we've used obs uh what's it called now eric the uh, the online one yeah they just changed the name it used to be obs ninja and now it's video ninja video I think, ninja i think specifically because he was trying to the developer was probably trying to say like this is more of a uh general video audio sharing tool not just to be used with obs Right, right. So we've used those tools in the background to stream our audio while we are sending control data to manipulate each other's clients or homemade instruments or synthesizers even um, through Collab Hub. Um, it speeds things up. It helps keep the synchronization issues, uh, you know, very minimal. Um, the same thing goes for video, right? We can share things like matrix data right, as, as numbers and as a big block of numbers and data, but we do not transmit video again, which is something like a WebRTC connection would, would do or a streaming platform would do. Um, it's not necessarily designed to be a remote control tool, although you could easily say like here is one client and it's just sending things unidirectionally to another device, um, but it's not designed to like remote control uh, Reaper or a DAW or things like that. Although you certainly could make Max for Live plugins that do all that. But we've designed it to try and be as bi-communicational as possible. So we are encouraging people to treat it that way, right? To send messages in any number of configurations um, in multiple directions simultaneously. Uh, and it doesn't make sound itself, right? Collab Hub is not like an API like um, the web audio API. It's meant to control or send data between or connect all of these different environments. So, you know, Nick and Eric mentioned this already earlier, but our goal in general is that if you are a Max user and you're coming to the web audio realm and you're learning a new way to make things in your instruments in the web browser, um, you may also find it kind of daunting to say, well, how do I connect to the two of them? Collab Hub's goal is to solve that and to make that simple to do, right? And so if you have the same instrument you've prototyped in different engines like PD, in uh, the web browser, in Max as a uh, microcontroller like Arduino, the sequencing and communication between those different versions of those instruments can all be done with one language, so to say, or kind of one process, which is Collab Hub. Uh, I can't remember here if I have this one. Sorry, my, mute, my mic was muted. Uh, I figured so we're obviously we're talking about connecting the different software, software platforms and you've got some hardware stuff to uh, introduce mm -hmm. as well. Right, yeah. So so one of the things that we were trying to focus on with Collab Hub once we kind of tackled the Mac side of things is that we did want it to become a way for network musical performances, which not only are done in the web, but it tend to be primarily done through web browsers today, um, can have like an extension of what hardware you use for those types of pieces. So I uh, done some research in the last couple of years and presented at last year's WAC on a system I designed called Bended IO, which is hardware you can attach to circuit bent instruments and control them through a client server architecture. And that's now being wrapped into Collab Hub so that from your phone, you can control a hacked device in any way, shape, or form you like. Uh, and that can now be an instrument that sends and receives data to web instruments. So your hardware set or pool of devices for network pieces are not just limited to phones and mobile devices, but to you know, uh, hardware that's ancient or brand new hardware. Um, if it's internet enabled microcontrollers, which we'll show you some examples later with the ESP32 boards, which are really cheap, popular boards for getting uh, IoT devices and interfaces set up. We have Collab Hub clients uh, that are in development and almost ready for release for those. And overall, you know, it's a way to make this sort of stuff hopefully simpler than it has been. We're certainly not the first pro protocol or, or platform or framework, I guess, um, to do this, but we're aiming to be the one that people hopefully come to for the sake of saying, well, I know how to connect all these various different creative environments together because the nomenclature of connecting a web to a Max device uh, or a Arduino to a web page and all of them together is so similar and it's very easy to get the hang of. Um, and hopefully it kind of solves those headaches of making things talk to one another. Yeah, one of the things that we really wanted to strive for with Collab Hub was 
ease of connectivity. Like we, not only was it obviously made for Macs and other things, but you, all of us in our introductions have talked about doing some sort of interconnected work. And there, we've all experienced this, this pain point of trying to figure out each other's IP addresses and ports and then putting all that information and then maybe someone drops and then you gotta change everything again. And using Collab Hub, since we're using mainly web uh, tools, we can eliminate having to, to look up all that information. And since it's server-based, uh, we everyone just phones to the server and, and shares that type of information. And we found that 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 really is a big hurdle for a lot of people, especially for people that are just now getting into interconnectivity, uh, uh, Internet of Things, those types of experiences. It also works on institutional networks. <laughs> so even sometimes like, I mean, you know, the whole IP thing or whatever, like as you start to get when, when you when you've done that a few times, you figure it out, you're like, OK, maybe that's not such a huge deal. It certainly is maybe the first time you have to do it. But even then, we've we've been at different institutions or or play festivals, conferences, whatever, where it's like, oh, we can't do any of our local network OSC communication because various ports are blocked or whatever. So uh, this Collab Hub, even if you want to use it locally, um, we've done that before too. Like we've been on stage and using Collab Hub with other people on the same stage because if we're presenting at a uh, public space, we can't, you know, we don't, there's no guarantee that our OSC communication or whatever we're sending each other is going to get to each other over the local network. Um, I'm not going to bother trying to play this over Zoom because last time I tried to, to, to show this uh, <laughs> in our previous workshop, it played terribly. So just a quick sort of overview. This is an example of, of Collab Hub in use, a piece called Ship of Theseus. We actually performed it yesterday. Uh, we showed a, a fixed video in the earlier concert because for us that would have been about 3.30 a.m. here in the U.S. So we, we, we gave a fixed video for that first performance, but the second performance we did actually live. So uh, Ship of Theseus uses Collab Hub to distribute controls. Each of us is sending a, uh, I think, three control parameters, one to each other musical, actually no, four, because there's there's actually, uh, you know, like, so for example, I would send one control parameter to Jeff, a different one to Anna, different one to Nick, different one to Tony. And we all are sort of set up in that configuration where each of us is sending at least one control signal to each of the other people. And it's up to them to map that however they want inside their instrument. So for example, Anna, um, this is kind of a cool, even though it was using Max, this was kind of a cool connection of like seeing, um, seeing Collab Hub and this network communication manifest in the real world. The data that we sent her was controlling the brightness of LEDs that were actually shining on her video setup. So a lot of her video setup incorporates a live video feed. And so our control data being sent to her was actually controlling the LEDs that were um, shining on her setup before it was you know, picked up by her camera. Um, and in my case, I have several delay lines that you know, if Jeff turns his control on his end, it changes the length of the delay line on my end. Uh, Tony, I think yours was a, a loop player, right? That if, was it the playback speed or, or something like that? Like when I would send you my control changes, it was controlling the playback speed of your instrument. Right, yeah, that's correct, yeah. Of, the, of the playbacks of the buffer, yeah. So even though we were all in max, uh, you know, one of us could have been using PD, one of us could have been using Super Collider or whatever. And the idea was that if I send you that control data, it doesn't matter that I'm sending it to you from Max, you can map it however you want in the instrument that you're using, even if that was, say, web audio. Um, so we use Collab Hub to show, send those controls to each other to advance the score. Those two images in the lower left hand are the score images that we're reading off of. We all just came up with a couple of sort of, uh, each of us came up with one image for a graphical score and um or sorry two images for a graphical score and we just co collected them all and those are presented in a in a random sequence each time we play this so every player sees a sequence of uh of four images that are played forward once and then backward once but the, those images are different for everyone so i'll see the first four this time but i might see the you know next four the next time that we play it or whatever so we're using collab to send um uh, cues to advance the score um, and also just cues to start and end the piece and stuff like that so like i said i'm not going to show the video um i can provide a link in actually do you mind nick can you pop a link of 
one of her performances into the chat just so if you want to see it later you can or uh, obviously sure. if you yep. saw the performance yesterday when we did it live you might have already seen this but uh, that's an example of collab hub being put to use right now and in the performance we used yesterday too we were able to uh, have it so that we had bi-directional communication between the audience uh, phones mm. and our max patches all of our different max patches including the visuals too so again that was just that idea of you know as a web audio network piece you didn't have to just do it only in the browser we could connect clients like max and a hardware synthesizer which we'll talk about later and visual simulators like in jitter and web pages too yeah one thing one thing i really liked about that setup um, and we're still sort of playing around with it but because because the mapping is up to the performer, whatever data they're getting from other people, it's up to them to map it how they want. Uh, we were able to sort of, maybe abstract is the wrong word, but you know, when you're doing a piece where audience members can participate and they're sending you data, it's like, well, how do you treat that data? And what we found is that sometimes, you know, I play, in addition to the processing I'm doing, I'm playing guitar and I'm sort of like playing with my, whatever I'm doing with my instrument, I'm maybe, has you have this gesture I'm trying to explore and Jeff might send me a control that just messes up one of my parameters and it kind of changes the direction of what I'm doing and that was kind of how we treated the audience participation in this is that there wasn't a one-to-one -one mapping of like if you move this slider you'll definitely hear a pitch go up in the resulting audio but when we got their data it was sort of just mapped to different parameters over instruments so that if somebody made a drastic change it wouldn't necessarily completely transform what we were doing but it would it would just kind of nudge us to try different things out. Some other realms that we've used Collab Hub are installation art. Uh, so we have created some web interfaces that interact with objects in the real world. And so this is an example of interactive installations or Internet of Things. Um, in the top right, we have the link for rumline.io, which is a remote installation that uses a web interface that has Collab Hub. So we have um, actuators that are spinning around making sound in the state of New York, but anyone with the web interface can interact with it. And it looks like a little pond where people can click on um, those little buttons. And while one person is interacting with a specific button, we know how many people are connected and when someone is interacting and we can disable those particular buttons for everyone else so that the experience is sort of handed over to that one individual for a brief window of time and then it's released back to everybody else. So they can you can tap out a little rhythm that gets played uh, on those actuators in New York and then we stream back the video and audio to everyone that's connected to the web interface. Uh, another example that we're working on is for multiplayer games is that connecting to um, a game engine like Unity, you can have multiplayer games or having the, the interface be on your mobile phone or, or browser and have a centralized uh, game experience or one that is shared, a, a shared game experience. Cool. Before we jump into the setup, do you guys have any questions for us at this point? Just about what Cloud Hub is, what it does, um, what it doesn't do. <laughs> Not yet, but I'm interested in maybe later talking about the whole parameter mapping because, like, it's a whole situation and like a whole mm -hmm. week of dedication because you know yeah. one to one is one thing, but then it becomes boring, or mm -hmm. at least maybe my parameter mappings aren't boring or something. <laughs> but that's would be interesting to see what your position is on those kinds of things, but maybe later. Sure. Yeah, uh, yeah. certainly if we have time at the end, I'd be happy to show you like, um, I, I think we'd all be happy to show you what we're doing with our instruments for that. And um, I, a lot of it is just trying to find the right, what is the right parameter, right? <laughs> like I, I have some non-linearities in my uh, max patch that that helps a lot, right? Because even if I get zero to 127 from one of the other players, it's not like, it's not gonna be an obvious uh, outcome on the other end or a, an easy, you know, or ob well, yeah, obvious or what's the word I'm looking for? The easy answer, I guess. One thing to add to that, Eric, sorry, before you move on, is because because uh, you brought the question up, Pedro. Um, there are a number of ways that we're going to dive into in just a couple of minutes of how you can change uh, how and when and what mappings you have set up 
which is really nice with, I think, what we've done with Collab Hub in that you don't need to restart a server or rewrite a server in order to connect this to that or this person's data to that person's data. And particularly when you build on that with like a graphical editable on the fly interface like Max, where you could just drag and connect to new cables, you're only, uh, there's extra, extra layers in which you can reroute things even mid performance. Um, so yeah, that's a great thing to bring up. And it's something that we were concerned about, I think as well with, uh, you know, you write one kind of network topology and then you're like, okay, here it is for the whole piece. And to change it means to stop the piece. And that's not the case with Collab Hub because of a couple different things we can talk about. All right, so our website for, uh, for the overall project is collabhub.io, collab-hub.io. Um, if you want to join our newsletter, um, you can do so from there. We also have a, a Discord that we, that we keep up. If, if you want to drop in, ask questions, whatever, you can join the Discord. Um, ignore that link on the bottom of the slide that, was, that did not get updated. Uh, it's very similar to the link that I put in the chat. So um, if you want to download the, uh, the files for the workshop today, don't follow that one, follow the one that I put in the chat. Uh, but anyway, these are kind of like how to get in touch with us, how to get access to the tools, whatever. Um, these are where, where you'll go for those things. Um, we so far um, have released the Max client. Oh, where's my other window? There it is. Okay, so, so far we have released a Max client and a PD client, and a, we have a web control interface that's just always running. Um, let me show you quick what the, um, well, no, sorry, we'll, we'll go through these individually, but uh, those are the three that are already released. So there's nothing, to, there's nothing to actually download or install for the web control interface. That's just, uh, that's just you know, hosting our server and always running. Uh, the Max and the peer data setups require a just the client, which is part of the download that uh, that we had for today. Okay, so uh, what is this? This is this is for later. This is the, yeah, yeah yeah. We can get uh, if you all want to join us and uh, go through because we're gonna do some demonstrations now. I think right, Nick, Eric. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm gonna we, I'm gonna go through the Max one first. Yeah. And then if you want y'all, the easiest way for you all to join us quickly would probably go to the web interface just to get an idea of how stuff is traded and how data is routed. But like Eric mentioned, if you do want to download Max MSP and do the free trial version, uh, you can then download the um, repo that we've got here too. We can help you get set up with that in just a moment. And you can see how this stuff goes from a different environment to, you know, something like the web together. I'll put a link to that web interface in the chat here for everybody. Okay, so uh, the workshop files look something like this once you've downloaded it. So we've got uh, a Max client, a PD client. Um, those are, if you were to go to the actual Max client release or the PD client release, these are essentially the files that are in there. Um, a caveat about that that I'll explain in a moment. Um, and then there's several ch hyphen whatever these different demos a drum demo a rooms demo some demos about organization stuff like that these are the things that we're going to go through today um let me just show if you if you visit that link if you visit the main repo link which oh, nope sorry github okay um you'll see that the there are individual links to the um, client files that come with this um, specific uh, repository. I just want to point out really quick, though, that these are not the maintained clients. We just wanted to make sure this was an easy thing to use for the workshop. Um, the folder, the directory that comes with the Max client, and the PD client in this particular workshop release is um, is not the production release. We've got a separate link to that. So if in the future you want to stay up to date with the Max client, with the PD client, whatever, just make sure you're actually pointing to the, um, the maintained repository. OK, so having downloaded that folder, looks something like this. I'm going to jump into the Max client for a second, um, just to kind of show you how we've organized everything um, and, and the basic functionality of, of Max. Um, Tony, why don't you have the web client open? Because what we might do is kind of 
Zoom doesn't, I don't think Zoom allows us to share screens side by side, but we'll pop back and forth and kind of show like, here's what's happening in Max, here's the outcome of the website and vice versa. All right, so in Max, in the Max client, there is a Max demo Max patch. Um, that's just literally contains everything that you need uh, to know about Collab Hub and how to use it in Max. And what we really try to do, if, if you are familiar with Max, if you're not familiar with Max, have you guys both used Max before? Or at least PD, it looks uh, similar, right? More pure data than Max. Okay, so PD, you'll at least have some familiarity, at least with, I mean, the messaging is very similar. Um, and that was kind of what we wanted to do with all these. We want to make sure that the client is taking care of um, translating things. You can stay in Max world. You can communicate using Max the way you're used to in terms of the way of like formatting messages uh, and sending data within Max, working with Max the way like it's in sort of its native language, I guess. And then the client takes care of translating that into whatever um whatever the server is expecting so you'll always be able to use this sort of native language of whatever platform you're on um, when you're using collab hub okay so the max client is divided into sub modules um, and those sub modules are the green boxes here in the bottom half if you've used max before you maybe are familiar with with b patchers each of these uh, modules, these sub modules is just a B patcher that's loaded up in this demo. So CH client is its own sub module, CH chat is its own sub module, uh, and then we have rooms, controls, and events. Now, the reason it was broken down this way is so that you could just use only what you needed. Um, if you are doing a fairly simple uh, setup, a simple piece, a simple installation, whatever, where you don't have to send a whole lot of data back and forth, or you just maybe all you need is a few control values then all you need is the CH client. You can just put that one B patcher in your max patch and call it a day. Everything else, the chat, the rooms, the controls and events are extending the functionality of, uh, uh, of extending the basic functionality. So on the max end here and the client, I'm gonna hit connect. And once it connects, I can see that, I can see the list of users. Nick Webb is connected right now, Texas Tony is connected uh i guess i should change my username what's a good uh eric the uber there we go uber is a uh a the nickname of people who live in upstate uh, not upstate new york upper michigan which i lived there for a while so okay so we've got three of us that have our usernames changed obviously to do that in max i just clicked the change username button it prompts for a username uh, I can send a chat message to Tony. Um, here, Tony, why don't you pull up your, why don't you share your screen? You got I'll start, it. I'll start sending you some stuff. Uh, for those of you who are also with us here, I hope you can see my my page here. If you are also on the web interface and you want to change your username, that is the one, two, three, fourth little sub block down here. Um, down here, you can change uh, your username in, in this text field and hit enter. And you should see yourself update over here in, in this list. Otherwise, when you log on from any client, Max, Web, Unity, Pure Data, any of these things we're working on now or, or have out now, um, the server gives you a, a random number behind the user. So yeah, so Eric, I'm already here, okay? And up at the top of the web interface, uh, there's just a, a blank space over here to the left and the right at the top that showcases chat messages coming in. Okay. Now, Eric sent that specifically <laughs> to me. Okay. So um, like in most networked kind of uh, topology kind of systems, um, you can send things to a lot of people or you can send things just to specific people. Right. So if I want to send something to everybody on the web interface, uh, I've got to have a target first and foremost to say who's going to get this. I could type the word all as my target. And that means that everybody should get this message. Hello, everybody. And send. And I get it as well as Eric would get it and Nick and everybody else connected too. Okay. But if I did want to send something specifically to Nick Webb, and Nick, you're what? Under, un, uh, let me just check here. Actually, I can check that out. Camel case. I that summer. Camel case. Perfect. I can send this to Nick Webb specifically and say hi to just. Nick, it'd be great if I could type well. 
right? And Nick will be the only one to receive that. If you're looking at his window um, in the Zoom chat there uh, or in the grid view, you should see that pop up in the right. Yep. And again, these are all are tagged in addition to the stuff we just mentioned. They're tagged specifically as chat messages. So they're in, in you know, Max in um, the web interface, you can get them and route them to specific areas. Right now in the HTML, we've got this routed just over to this little div here, this little window. Um, other data that we'll show you in a bit would come in over here. So that's another way that you can say, well, this is chat messages. Don't use this in a performance by you know, sending this to a synth module or to something else or do, right? You can tag that specifically, again, to route it to where you want and what you want it to do. I'll stop sharing here, Eric, so you guys can take over and show what else. Thank you. All right, so I'm bringing Max back up here. Um, okay, so obviously I sent that howdy tony message from the simple chat down here um in terms of the messaging in max we're going to if we look up here this section that says push there's two kinds of uh two modes of communication in collab hub there's push and there's publish um push will be sent directly to the intended target without them having to do anything Publish is more of a almost like an observer model or like a pub sub model where uh, if you publish a specific control, it's only going to go to the people who have subscribed to that control or are observing that control. Um, so if I want to send, say, a control value uh, with the header value two to everybody, this is how I would format it in Max. I prepend it with the word push, and then all is the target value two is the header for that particular control and then uh, this is just the variable so it's whatever i whatever i'm gonna put in this message box here so if you are on the web interface you should be getting value two from me right now i don't know if you can see in nick's tiny little thumbnail window there he's getting value two in the in the um in the browser interface so again, push is going to go to the intended target no matter what. They don't have to do anything to get that value. And if I'm putting the target in as all, that, that's like a reserved word that we use to go to everybody. Um, instead of all, you could have just a specific username or room, which Tony kind of showed already with chat. But obviously, that works also with control data. So if I put Texas Tony in here, actually, wait, I'll put in whoever's the smiley face. Where's the carrot? I always forget where the carrot is. <laughs> Me too. Six. It's six. <laughs> I forget that All right. too. So I can send just that person value to. So whoever that is, is hopefully getting that now. Um, and there's no, for our performances, we've generally limited the control data that we send each other to be from zero to 127 midi numbers obviously and that's just because we're all using midi controllers in some way so it's like the resolution's not there why bother sending each other you know a zero to a thousand when your midi interface is only going to be zero to 127 anyway um but this could be i could send a float to all so if i send this float to all you should now get float values Mm -hmm. uh, I can send a list, uh, what what Max calls uh, uh, an array in Max is called a list. It's just an array. So I could send an array of multiple values. Oops. And I don't have to change anything about uh, the way that I'm formatting the message. It'll still say push all the header, which is value two, or maybe something more descriptive would be like uh x y let's send an x y too so i can pack together an x and a y value so now x y two should be showing up for everybody mm -hmm. cool um so controls are anything continuous that you, and this is, again, this is all through Collab Hub, not just in Max. Something that's a control 
means that on the other end, you're expecting to get a header valued by a value or set of values, right? Slider one, and then a bunch of numbers after that, or X, Y, and a bunch of numbers after that. You can also send events, which are just in max, it would be like a bang and PD, it would be like a bang. An event is just something that's an instantaneous, like, okay, do this one specific thing now. Uh, it could be play, it could be advanced score, it could be whatever. It's not, there's no values that are come, gonna come after that reserved header. Um, and you don't have to differentiate between those on, the, on your end in the software. Max in the background, or I should say in the client, is taking care of knowing whether the incoming data is an event or a control. And it's, the client is taking care of handling that the way it's supposed to be handled. So if I click this bang, this button here above push all bang two, then everybody should be getting the event bang two. And so there's no, again, there's no values that come after bang two. Um, I will, we'll, we'll talk about um, uh, the difference of between push and publish events a little bit more later, but at least you can see now, like on the max end of things, I'm formatting everything the way I expect to in max, just as a, a list of, of terms, basically. Um, Tony, send me something from the, send something to all from the web interface. Sure thing. So I'm going to do web slider one, uh, I'm sorry, web slider three. This is going to be pushed to everybody. And right now you should be getting values like 34, 58. Yep. So this is how it's coming into max from the server is just, just the header name and then the actual value. So in max or in PD, what you usually would do with something like that is you know, I can route by the name web slider three. If you're familiar with Max, this is what you're used to doing. If you want to route messages based upon whatever header they have, then you just create a route object and then the, only the value will come out the other side. And that's the way that you could send, say, for example, several different controls to different people. You give them each a different header on the Max side or on the PD side, you create a route object and you can route, route those, map them wherever you need them to go. Uh, this raw data from server section, this is something that I only included for today's demo patch. It's not part of the actual uh, Max client release, but at least you can see what things look like when they're coming in um, and how, you know, a lot of this raw data is being parsed and routed by default by the Max client. Um, oh, one more thing I forgot is in the client section, there's this flags button. Um, so what this does is if you want to know who it's coming from, you just enable this flags uh, option in the user's area. So Tony, send me that same web slider three again. Yep. Okay, here we go. So now as a raw value, it says Texas Tony web slider three. So I can sort of more granularly map things. If I know I'm going to get these five controls from, from Texas Tony, then I can route specifically his controls out based on his username. Um, and that, again, that message is, is his na username is prepended on those incoming messages because I have this flags option on in Max. Yeah, what's nice about the, the way we've done this is we're sending a lot of data and metadata, but uh, particularly in clients like Max, where you have the ability to have um, like a dictionary to take that metadata or extra data and break it down into different little sub values and actually see like the JSON formatting a bit better. Um, you can toggle that on or off. So if you really want all the extra data, you can toggle that on momentarily. If you don't need it, maybe for performance, but just want to check it, you can then toggle it off. Um, or if you really want it always, like Eric showed you, you can always route it out and break it out into a number of different places. Um, so the rest of the max user interface is, uh, like I said, it's all ways to extend the function, the basic functionality. The basic functionality is all available just from this CH client. Um, the incoming messages I was getting are actually coming from this uh, R, which is receive object in max. You can, you can, this will work regard, as long as you have that client, you'll always be getting the server messages from this R from CH server object. You can also get them directly out of the bottom of the client actually has a data outlet. So if you want, you can just connect everything right to here at the bottom of the CH client. And that's true actually of all the submodules. Every submodule outlet is just getting everything from the server. Send me some more, Tony. 
there we go. Yeah. So every sub module output is, is going to just get everything. So that that's one thing too. And it just makes it easier to set up a max patch is because if you've got your client sub module over here and you've got your room sub module over here and you're like, how am I going to route everything where I want it to go? But you've got like three different ways that you can get the messages. You can get them from any of the sub module outlets or just from the, um, are from ch server object um the chat is a more the chat chat sub module is just a more granular way to do chat so um this you could you could format these messages yourself but the sub modules in max just make it easy all the users and rooms uh are listed down here and this menu is automatically populated in max if you have this ch chat sub module loaded so if I want to sort of have a dynamic way to interact with people, like I know people are going to be coming and leaving, and I don't, you know, you know, know what everyone's name is going to be. If I load the ch chat sub module, then this keeps track of who the connected users are for me, um, and also the different rooms, which we haven't done set up rooms yet, but we'll talk about that more uh, later on. Speaking of rooms, the room sub module. So um, Collab Hub uses the Socket.io library and. By default, what that library provides is um, room functionality within whatever uh, namespace you're in. So we're all currently connected to the to the namespace hub. That's the default namespace, um, and only people that are in the hub namespace can see each other. But um, if we were to make different rooms, then we could sort of subdivide ourselves into different parts of the ensemble. Maybe we had people who were like, I don't know, uh, hi frequency room maybe there are people who are responsible for the high frequencies so we can make a room where if everyone that's responsible for high frequencies joined that room then they could communicate just with each other um, and you can of course have several rooms tony's going to do some more demonstration about room communication later on but that's what this sub module allows is to manage and and see those rooms and join them um, and then the separate controls and events Submodules uh, show you which events have been published using the publish mode. So the push messages I sent earlier are not listed here, but anybody that's sending a, a published control or a published event, uh, those will be listed here. And this is where you can choose to subscribe or observe those uh, specific controls that were published. Um, so that I just want to give an overview of what the Max client looks like, and also gives you a sort of a brief intro into into clap up communication, at least from the Max end. Um, Tony, why not? Since you already have it pulled up, why don't you do an overview of the rest of the web interface? Sure. Yeah. So um, let me just check here. Yes. I, I okay. should I I should mention real quick too that after that and after we look at PD, I am going to show the web audio example uh, from the stuff that I. Uh, put together. So that's sort of separate from the web-based interface, but I just wanted to mention that real quick. Yeah, the web-based interface, like Eric's mentioning here, we have just up and running for a couple of reasons. One, it's for uh, you to be able to go and to uh, test, right, to see if your topologies that you want to design uh, are going to work the way you're hoping they will. And it's a way for you, us to kind of quickly showcase some of the features of Collab Hub, um, you know, just, just with the routing. So with the web interface here, right, you notice there's a couple of other things that we haven't talked about yet. Um, so far, we've been using what have been called push messages, right? So for instance, when we were sending an event to everyone, right, like I went ahead here and changed this event uh, from web events to BAM, right? So I can actually change this again to BAM1 or back to BAM just by clicking in this text field and, and heading here. I'm not actually sending the event yet. I'm just changing what the header label for the event will be. Uh, and right now, if I click on this, right, I'm sending it as a push message. So everybody should have gotten that uh, coming up into their incoming messages box on Max or here on the web interface. Um, if I wanted to send it to a specific room, right, I could do that from this format, right? With push instead of all, right? My target would be the name of the room. So this is an example with a room like one, two, three. Um, and that would be sent to everybody if they're in that room. Um, publish in comparison to push is a bit different. We wanted to have an option where you could create a message 
right? Like a control type or an event type. And then other users could choose whether they wanted to subscribe to those data streams temporarily or throughout an entire performance or event, but they had to go through the extra step of being able to do that. Um, that acts, that gives you a couple of different options, right? It gives you the ability to create a piece where your audience participants can choose which data they want to grab. They can choose to temporarily move away from a data stream. They can kind of jump between data streams. And maybe as performers, it gives you the ability to temporarily kind of route your interactions in a different way without having to build a topology, break it down, rewrite a server or any kind of like routing code and start over again. So why don't we do this? Nick, do you want to do some... Um, can you do any, pub you can do the publishing stuff with what you got up now, perhaps? Yep. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. So right now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go over here and I'm going to publish a web event. Um, and it's, or sorry, it's an event called web event one. And I'm going to publish this out to everyone. Now, when I click on this, you're not going to see it in your incoming messages block just yet. But if you look at Nick's window, where you are going to see it is further down the page in this section called published events. So because I've sent web event one with a published format, uh, it doesn't get sent to you, but it gets kind of queued in this little section here saying, hey, here are events that have been published that you can go ahead and subscribe to if you'd like, right? So web event one is waiting, web event two is waiting. Um, Nick, can you send one actually from one of your interfaces, like a different one? Oh, yeah, I can publish. Let's see. So you're in I pure data there. A PD event. So I'm originating from our PD client, publish PD event. Do you see that? Did that appear for you guys? Uh, I don't see it just yet under all events. Is it maybe? I might be logged into the wrong server. Oh, um, yeah, OK. See. Let, I'll publish this web slider too. There we go. Perfect. So down here, uh, we have web slider two as a published control, right? A slider would be a control because it has a header and a data point, not just a header. So right now we've got a couple options, web event one and two for events, web slider one and two for um, controls. And I can go ahead here and then choose which ones I want to observe. So I'm going to go here and I'm going to observe web slider one. On the web interface, I graphically see a little change here that moves it to my observe controls columns. And now if anybody goes and uh, goes back up here to um, publish web slider one and changes that, I should be able to start seeing that here in my incoming messages because that's been published and I've been able to see it. So here's PD event here, right, which I had subscribed to. Or no, that's a push one. I will, right. I will move my web slider two. Oh, I think I saw one, Nick. I did. I subscribed to web slider one. Oh, okay, gotcha. I think someone else had actually originally moved it, so they're the originator right now. Oh, I see. Oh, there we go. Perfect. Who was that? Who did that? Lewis. That was. That was you, Lewis. Okay, great. So Lewis, you published it. I subscribed to it. So now you and I have that kind of con a special connection there, right? Um, we can do that in a couple different ways as well, right? Like if I publish web event one, or if I change this here to just say like uh, test pub, right? I can publish that to everyone. And you should be able to scroll down here and see that as an available published event, right? Now, I can't subscribe to it because I have been the one to originate it, right? But somebody else should be able to test that and grab that and subscribe to it. And when you do, it'll move over to your observed events. Okay, so Nick, you subscribe to it, right? Yes, I subscribe okay. to test pub. So I'm going to go over here back to the top and push it or publish it technically. And there you go. You can see test pub coming in. Um, again, we wanted to be able to have this just so you had some more flexibility, right? Like, do you want to observe this at this moment? 
you can choose to do so. It's an extra step, right? It's definitely an extra step because you're not automatically going to receive something that's published. You're not going to guarantee that if you publish something that all of your other clients are going to get it. They need to opt into it. But we wanted that extra kind of separation of control to allow you to do that flexibility and not always get all these data streams coming at you all at once um, for the entire performance. So could you so, sorry, interrupt? Me? Yeah, oh. please, please. Sorry, Luis. So could you say that then this um, subscribing to the events is, is almost the same as the room, but more specific to one kind of data or something like that? Because the room it works, you send data to the room and then everyone is mm -hmm. so it's, Is it comparable in any way then? Or am I getting all mixed up? No, 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 you're on it. I, I, I mean, Eric, please chime he, in yeah, with me here he's, too. That's we actually we almost used room. Uh, one thing we explored was using room functionality to do the subscriptions. Um, it just became too much to to manage on the on the back end. But that was essentially you're right. Yeah, like if you uh, if you subscribe to a control or sorry if you observe a control, it's almost like you joined a room with that control's name. That's that's not really exactly what's happening on the back end. But we did look at doing it that way because in in essence that's kind of how it's functioning. And to build on that, right, you can actually combine the two of these things that you just uh, talked about there, Pedro, right? So this one here where I'm published to everyone, right, that is that publish subscribability to every single user. However, I can send a published message to just people who have already joined a specific room. <laughs> And it's now, again, they need to subscribe or observe it and choose that observation. But the only people who have that choice are people in like, in this case, room one, two, three, right? They're the only ones who now see the availability of, oh, I can choose to check that out or choose not to. People in other rooms um, will not. Yeah. Pedro, did you have a question too? Um, or as well, or did anybody else have any other questions about this? Um, I oh, sorry, just, Lewis. Uh, Lewis, I'm sorry. Yeah. That's all right. I was just wondering. Um, so if I change my header to test pub, mm -hmm. uh, that will so everybody who subscribed to test pub will get uh, events as well. Yes. Yeah, we've we've sort of uh, this is one of the debates that we had about the design of this is whether. Um, you know, whether like once one person claims a published event name, should should it be off the table at that point? And that's, that's like where that flags functionality could come in handy, is that if multiple people are using the same header, you can still on the client end separate them by who's sending that exact same header name. But we're not limiting like, you know, multiple people, multiple people can say, can send the same header for a control or the same header for an event. Um, and that that was kind of like that ability is there because you know if, if it's an impromptu thing for example you know maybe it's just nice to just throw start throwing data out there and not worry about necessarily who it's coming from or where it's coming from um but if you want to know specifically uh, this is the slider from lewis this is slider from nick this is slider from pedro then you can just sort by um by who the sender is by turning that flags detail on in there is a slight uh, detail with, with this one with publish if tony is the original publisher you actually lewis cannot send through that header so right now we've implemented that it, you can try it but um i'm pretty sure that since i'm a subscriber to test pub and tony originally was the publisher um you will not be able to send an event under that same header so, so for push, it, there's no reservations, but for publish, there is. For, yeah. Correct, correct. Uh, right. Reservations of the header names, yeah. Correct. So hopefully, does that clarify things a bit? It, it, it is something that it, um, we've kind of talked about this in, in performances. It's been rare that we've used both of these methodologies, push and publish in the same piece. You could, and there's certainly something we're looking to see people's creativity and, and to see where they'd want to do that and, and how they'd want to do that. Um, but for us, we've kind of found that we either want to have all messages be pushed out there for everybody to observe um, and to get all this data passed 
back and forth unless they're segregated in different rooms, or we've wanted to go the publish route where you have that active choice of needing to subscribe and observe. Um, and getting used to the differences between them, again, there's upsides and downsides based on what you're looking to achieve. Uh, Nick, sorry, I stepped away for a second to grab water. Did you show the PD client yet? We have not yet, no. Yeah. I'll that stop would... sharing, Nick, if you want to go ahead. Yeah, we'll oh, take a look at that one because it has an extra, has one extra step, PD. Yeah, so with our PD client, we ha we are working on a standalone, which is going to make the setup a little bit more seamless. But at the moment, if you download that package that Eric had linked earlier, we have a demo patch as well as a working node package that connects you to the server. So um, there, in that link that Eric sent you, there, there is a step-by-step -step readme to get you connected. Um, but we'll demonstrate some of it, which is going to be really similar to what you've seen already <laughs> in terms of functionality to the Macs and the web version. So if you have your web client up, you should be able to see that I'm going to push an, push all a PD events to everybody. So this is the push, of course, is the one that you don't have to subscribe to. And you should be able to see that value come into your incoming messages. Uh, similarly, I'm going to push all a PD slider, and you should be able to see that as well. I can change my name. Um, my name in the connections should be uh, Nick PD. And I could change it now to something like PD client. And so that should be changed for you as well. Similarly, you can send chat messages. Uh, hopefully you all saw something, hello from PD user, do a barrel roll. And then I can also receive uh, web events. So maybe Tony can send, or Eric can send a web event three or one of you guys, and I should be able to see this appear in my interface. Sorry, do you want web event or web slider? Uh, how about web event? Web event. There it is. Web event yep. three. There it Great. is. Mm -hmm. uh, and I saw that someone did web web slider as well, and that changed. Um, so. The the one difference, as Nick kind of mentioned already, but he's got he. This is the one case where he's got to run terminal in the background, mm -hmm. um, and that is the that's the client. The client for PD, the client is running in a a separate Node script because PD doesn't have native Node support the way that Max does, and so he we're using UDP um, networking protocol to send messages from the Node client into PD. In what is it? Foodie is the name of it, right? The yeah, the foodie. style of messaging that 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 mm -hmm. PD uses. So it's still coming into PD, looking just like a regular PD message. Yeah. Why Why wouldn't you just send UDP messages straight from your server? Uh, a lot of it has to do with the as tr with using like web pro specifically web ports, like um, using web sockets and communicating over web ports, and not having to worry about any UDP. Um, Port, uh, any issues on like, say, for example, like institutional networks, like any issues, run, like, because that's what OSC is, right? It's sending UDP packets. And a lot of times we would be in an institution and perhaps that port was blocked or something. We couldn't get that traffic to each other. Right. Um, that's the main reason. Makes sense. The end goal is that um, right now we want to eliminate this, this terminal step for people that are not familiar with terminal or maybe have some aversion to it, not familiar. And so the we want to, we, we are working on a an electron wrapper so that the interface is much more user-friendly and the experience is that is like a native app so that you can just pull up the client and then you can interface with not only PD, but things like touch designer or some other uh, creative application and eliminate the steps of having to type in stuff, but just say, I wanna load up the PD client and then connect to Colab Hub. I want to load up the touch designer client and connect to Colab Hub. And then you don't have to worry about uh, typing in some, some node script uh, start or, or NPM package download and stuff like that. Cool. Um, I'm going to show, oh, Nick, you're not actually sharing your screen, are you? You're using your OBS no, was, camera. Yeah. Cool. So it, obviously, this is the web audio conference. And so a lot of what we talked about so far isn't. isn't really web audio, but 
Uh, we did have a web audio component like to our performance, for example, the other day, and I wanted to show just a quick, um, quick way to set up if you want to incorporate Collab Hub into your web audio project, how you would do that. So first of all, the um, this was the web interface for the piece that we performed yesterday. Very simple. It was really just a way for audience members to sort of like follow along with the score. Um, I'm not running the the my when I run this when we play this piece, I run in my max patch. I I am the conductor basically, so I'm the one who has to send out the the communication to advance the score pages. I don't have that open right now, but the images would load here. And there's obviously a, a you know a fairly simple tone JS instrument that's that's like a drone and some percussive sounds basically. So there'd be some simple sounds that people could make on their local uh, in their local browser, but then they're sending us this control data is actually coming into all the Max users. Whatever changes are happening here are also influencing the parameters on the Max end. Um, so this. Sorry, one second. Let me find where this script is. All right, so we'll take a look at what that um, incoming and outgoing collab hub messages, what that looks like in the uh, uh, the website of things. Okay. So in my uh, wax sound script here, um, oh, nope, sorry, it's in a different script. It is in the interface script. All right, so here is, uh, again, it's, it, since Collab Hub is based on Socket.io, once you are in, web audio land, you can essentially just use the socket IO library and just adhere to what our sort of event control, etc. protocols are. So all that's happening in the case of um, the piece that we performed yesterday, there's only a few messages that the web audio site is listening for in this socket on um, right here. It's looking for incoming events, events named event and then whatever the header of that event incoming is. So it's expecting an event called audience score, expecting an event called, uh, event called audience end, one called drone down and one called drone up. So those were me as the conductor running the max patch. Those were the four things I was sending out to all everyone that had the web uh, interface for that piece loaded up, the ship of Theseus piece. Um, in our GitHub repo, I added sort of a cheat sheet to the bottom. So this is new since the last time we uh, we gave this workshop. Oops, sorry, wrong one. Collab Hub workshop. So just kind of as a start, we've got a using Collab Hub and Web Audio Applications page, um, and we're sort of still. This is actually would be a great thing to get some feedback from you guys on because we're sort of still sort of working through how do we want to make this uh, into some sort of release or some sort of something for people who use web audio do we really need to have a whole separate library or package or whatever do we need just to have good documentation you know what what exactly do we need so this is just the start of how would you use this you would obviously you would have the sakadeo library as part of your um your application and then this is the essentially the protocol of the messages controls have um header values mode and target properties events have just header mode and target and mode again is pub push or publish target is going to be all for everyone a username or a room name and then chat messages are just the chat and target properties target again being all user or room uh, on the receiving end this is what you would expect on um, this is what you would want on the client end if you were doing some sort of you know, if you were using multiple web audio based instruments, for example, browser based instruments performing with people remotely, um, this is what you would be looking for for incoming events. So that really, again, this is really just using the Socket.io library, but with this sort of protocol that we've developed for Collab Hub um, that 
ultimately, even if you just sort of look at these, ex these few examples here and maybe dig into the max client script yourself a little bit, if you're familiar with, you know, if, if you are someone who, who writes JavaScript, you could probably um, essentially start incorporate, incorporating this into your web audio application already. Um, let me see if, what was the other thing I was gonna put here? I think that's all for the web audio side. So um, how are we doing on time here? 152. I think at the one and a half hour mark is when we were about to take a break. Um, does anybody have any questions about using it uh, about the web audio side or maybe some suggestions about what you as somebody doing web audio would want to see if you want to communicate with other people using maybe other platforms? What would make this an easy tool for you to use? Uh, or should we just essentially have documentation that says, use the Socket li library, here's the kind of message formatting. I know nothing about web audio, so I have no opinion. I'm stupid in that realm. <laughs> OK. <laughs> it's very self-deprecating. <laughs> No, it's realistic. I mean, I know what I'm capable of and what I'm not, and that's good. Yeah. 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 So, um, and, and so maybe, you know, you may never use it with web audio, right? You may use it with Max or PD or whatever else. Uh, but, you know, certainly if somebody else is doing web audio based stuff, they can still, they can just add these, this messaging protocol essentially into their, uh, into their script and then they can send, you know, things to you. You can send things to them. One thing we're um, also kind of considering too, and we can show this a little bit um, later today if there's some interest is we're, we're adding um, a, a whole kind of line of like what we call the Collab Hub hardware suite, which is um, like I mentioned earlier, um, a library for Arduinos or for wireless microcontroller uh, interactivity um, for some pre-existing pieces of hardware that utilize things like this. Um, for Eurorack synth users, there's an um, open source module called the Motivation Radio, which is an ESP32 at its heart. And it just adds um, CV and gate input and outputs, and you write the firmware for it so it can be whatever you'd like it to be. I've written one that connects to Collab Hub as its own client. So we've actually used in a couple of performances uh, where people are sending me from Max or from the web headers and controls and events that actually don't go through Max out to my synth or have any intermediary. It goes right to my synthesizer and triggers gates or samples CV and sends it out as if it were a slider or a, or a button or some kind of like a bang or something like that. So in addition to that, we're also looking to bring over things to other existing instruments that can run node or can use um, web enableability like the uh, Mono Norns, which runs um, on a basically a Raspberry Pi. It has an ecosystem of scripts written in Lua that run Super Collider as an audio engine. There's already been some great stuff with connecting Norns to Norns using web server stuff. And so we'll be developing that to bring to Collab Hub too. And part of that kind of goes with what Eric mentioned as well. For any of these other clients, we're, we're interested to see what kind of nomenclature or things like that would be consistent in script-based languages versus the graphical languages we've already played with uh, in Max and Pure Data. So like you mentioned, Eric, yeah, we're getting close here to taking a break. I think what would be good then is if we're getting close to taking a break here that when we get back, we could probably dive right into just kind of playing around and having yeah. you all test out what we've gone over so far and to see what you run into, what are some uh, things you'd like to play around with. Um, and, and we can kind of just, yeah, see if any questions pop up from there. Maybe just another small question from me, I'm sorry. I no, go for it, please, yeah. Um, then I, from what I understand, then it's not possible to have like, I don't know if you do you use Sonobus or something like that, or do you know? more or less how it works. What, what I want to say is, if there are five concerts with 10 people each performing, all mm -hmm. happening at the same day at the same time, there's gonna be 50 people in one web page of um, Collab Hub. So it's not possible to separate into smaller channels, let's call it sort of like a Discord thing. 
I don't know if that's possible Actually, or not. Actually, yeah, Nick, do you want to do you want to tackle that? Because I think there's something that we can that that's close to to what he's addressing, right? But the, there is ways to do this for sure. So right now, we the server it, it is able to be separated into what we call namespaces. We we just had a little discussion about rooms, right? And mm -hmm. each room actually is siloed within a specific namespace. And so we can give you a specific namespace or five different namespaces so that if, let's say it's each different concerts, you don't want their data to be shared amongst each concert, they can be separated uh, more safely that way so that you don't accidentally send web slider one to the wrong recipient. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We, we all, during our demos, we were all connecting to um, the namespace called Hub, which is the default namespace, but we've made namespaces for Ohio State University um, so that their laptop ensemble would only see each other. Um, I think there were a couple other ones that we've made, but basically just like, there's been a couple of times where people have requested them and we've made them. And I say we, I mean, Nick. Nick's, <laughs> some people have requested them and then Nick makes them, so. <laughs> Right. And so that's something that we, we want to promote as well, right? That if you, Pedro, had a, a project and you said, well, I need five different namespaces because one namespace with multiple rooms isn't quite what I need, um, then that's possible to do, right? And all the communication, even if there's a hundred rooms, let's say, within each namespace is all co-located in those kind of walled off gardens, so to say, mm -hmm. right? Um, or like for something like the laptop ensemble example, Eric mentioned, they have one namespace, but they could have a different room for each piece. So it's not too difficult for their uh, performers to hop from piece to piece yeah. um, without having to disconnect and reconnect to a completely different namespace. Mm, that's very nice. Yeah, cool. Yeah. What, so what are you saying? Oh, go ahead. What are your thoughts? My thoughts? Oh, sure. Yeah. Does oh. that kind of solve what you were considering or thinking about? Like, no, for sure. Just like a, a, just like data f overflowing to somewhere else where it shouldn't supposed to be. But it would be actually quite interesting if you just like plan concerts, like with a bunch of people and suddenly all these walls break down and like data flowing all around. That's <laughs> yeah, that'd be my great. chaotic nature. I would love to do that. Yeah, that would be very cool. So uh, according to the WAC schedule, um, there's like a half hour coffee break right now, which I feel like we mm -hmm. should probably honor because uh, yes. it's also meant to be networking time. So as part of the, the resources that we developed for the workshop today, we've got a bunch of different demos in there. Um, so once we come back from the, the break, we'll start going through those demos. And uh, essentially, there's just like different ways that we've applied um, applied Collab Hub, different ways that you know you can try it out and at least have some some things to look at and think about how to incorporate this into your own, into your own stuff. Yeah. Um, and so if I you're guess... a Max user too, go ahead and download that because we're going to, some of them are web-based, some of them are Max-based. So if you want to be interacting with those demos, this could be a time to do it. Great. All right. I guess we'll see y'all back here in half an hour and we'll should just leave the, the Zoom session running, I think. So we'll see y'all at uh, in 30 minutes. Cool, thank you. All right, everybody. Well, welcome back. Thanks for, thanks for coming back. Hope you had a good coffee break. Nick, do you want to kind of walk us through where we'll go from here? Uh, sure, yeah. So our next goal for this next session is to go through some of these example or demonstrations that we have. And um, so, some of these are, are using Max and some of them will also be using the, the web interface. So um, hopefully you can follow along one way or another. And, and one of the things that we're hoping to highlight is um, just like some examples of how you might use Collab Hub. And you may not um, uh, use it exactly the same way that we're demoing, <clears throat> but hopefully it gives you some ideas and when you want to implement Collab Hub for your usage, uh, you could maybe take a, a portion of it or implement it in a similar way because we do address ways to send messages or how we are having each client talk to each other. Right. Yeah. And the first thing I think we, we were going to start off with was just kind of where we ended, um, which is like rooms organization, right? So we talked about the difference when we ended between uh, namespace, right? Which is essentially sort of like a building, right? And then within that namespace, you can have many different rooms. Um, the example I'm going to show here now is available in the downloads that um, the, the GitHub repo, the package that Eric showed you earlier today. So if you do have Max open and you'd like to kind of walk through this with me, you can. 
This is in a folder called CH uh, Rooms Demo. And inside of that, you'll see a folder. Uh, that's the um, it, all the materials for an Arduino example I'm going to show you along with this um, demo. And then there's the max patch called CH Room Distribution Example. So you can feel free to open that one up here and to connect to the server. I'm going to do that and then share my screen. Okay. Right here. Okay, so you should be able to see this patch here on uh, the Zoom chat, and then maybe you have this open right now. So I've got my uh, web browser still open here as Texas Tony, and then here I am on the Max patch as Tony on Max, right? Um, now, right now, we have, um, and I think here it's because I connected uh, before maybe we had uh, done this. Um, but right now you can notice that I'm just using the client module and I'm using the rooms module. And so right now I'm actually not hey, Tony. seeing, oh yeah, Eric, go ahead, sorry, please. Sorry, I did the same thing. Make sure you have all your other, uh, clients closed. That oh, I've why... got you. Okay. That could be maybe why it's happening, huh? Let me go and, uh, I think I've got the other one to close. You, you want to close the web browser too, just to, and come back to it? No, just the max ones. Oh, I've got you. Okay. Is Texas Tony your web one? That's my web one. Yeah. Oh, gotcha. Sorry. I had multiple max ones open. So I just want to make sure you. Oh, yeah. Was making my good. mistake. Here, I'm going to connect again here. Here we go. So I've connected again here and let's change my username. Max. There we go. Okay. Um, and yeah, so we were talking a little bit about rooms here. Now, the way that rooms work with Collab Hub is that you first have to um, either join a room uh, to create it. Right. And that'll put you in that room automatically. And you can do that from a couple of different places. Right. So right now we're not seeing any currently available rooms, but I am going to make a room uh, by actually plugging in and turning on my ESP32 uh, Arduino microcontroller. And I'll show you the code for that in just a moment. So you can see how that process goes. So I have people here. Look at that. Okay. So I've got my microcontroller plugged in and turning on. And right now it's connecting to my Wi-Fi network <clears throat> and connecting to the Collab Hub server. Okay. And if you're watching my screen here, you've seen a couple of things happen. So first you saw that a new user logged on. Okay. And it's called ESP client. And then you also saw that there's now an available room, right? Uh, that room was created when this uh, Arduino asked to join a room that didn't already exist. So if you're joining a room that does not already exist, it's in fact creating that room for you. Now, as the Max user here, I'm not in any room, okay? I'm actually over here uh, saying that this is an available room and my room section here is empty. So if I wanna join the Arduino room, I can click on this drop-down menu here and go down and choose to join that Arduino room uh, if I like. Um, I actually, let's see one second here. I might be on the wrong, here we go. Yeah, I was looking at the wrong one here really quickly. Just one second. Uh, oh, we close that. Okay, great. So uh, if we wanna make another room, Nick, do you maybe wanna go on the uh, web browser interface and you can maybe show that camera look there and create a different room? Sure, I can do that. I will, oops. Pull up the monkeys. Okay, on the browser, I'm going to create a new room. I'm going to say this is going to be Nick's room. I'm scrolling all the way down. It'll be Nick's room. Okay, and so now I've got two available rooms that I could join here if I'd like, right? Um, and this can be done from the Max client itself, right? You can actually just send a message that's the join room header, uh, and then it would actually make that room for you. I'm actually going to join here, no rooms at the moment, okay? But what I am going to do is use this Max patch to send data to different rooms, okay? So what I've got going on down here is like Eric showed you at the beginning of the workshop today, I have just a simple receive object from Max, which lets you receive data, um, without having a patch cable. 
and I'm receiving it from the CH server, which is actually tying together with our Max um, Collab Hub submodules here. So what I'm doing is I'm waiting for a message to come from the server that's called Available Rooms U Menu. This is a special message that uh, lists the rooms in a format that the Max U Menu object can easily accept and collect. And that's allowing me to do this here. I've got a little U menu object down here that's constantly updating whenever a new room is created by any client for the server to choose from. If I want to do that um, without waiting for the server to send it, I can always send a message to the server using the send to ch server object and say, hey, get me the available rooms, and it'll update it anytime I actually want it to. So what I'm going to do here, Nick, if you've got your web browser interface open, I'm going to yep. choose to send you a message. Okay. So I've used the U menu to send a message to Nick's room. Uh, you can see this window right here, this max message box is showing me what that message is going to look like when it gets sent. I'm going to send it as a push model. So Nick doesn't have to subscribe to this. He's going to get it no matter what. Uh, it's going to be sent only to the users in Nick's rooms. So again, not every user will get this, only those who have joined the Nick's room room. And I'm just going to send an event here, and that event's going to be called BAM. So I'm not sending a, a control message, which would come with a header, label, and a piece of data. I'm just sending an event. And you can see that pop up there in Nick's window there. Okay. If you want to get that, you would have to make sure that on the web interface or in a Max patch, if you're running like the one like the one I'm running here, that you've chosen to join Nick's room. Otherwise, you wouldn't get that. Now, that example, right, can be extended in any number of ways. So, for instance, if I want to go ahead and send something to my Arduino instead, all I have to do is change the room that it's been sent to. And if you can see my camera view here along with the screen share, I'm sending a BAM event just to my Arduino, and it's toggling on this little blue light here on the ESP32, right? Every time there's a BAM, the light's going to toggle on and off. And if I update this here to Nick's room, again, there's just some really quick and instantaneous routing, right? The light stays on, so it's not getting the message because it's going to a different room. Uh, the Arduino code for this is actually pretty straightforward. And like Nick said and Eric had said earlier, we're developing kind of the nomenclature and the Collab Hub uh, process for what text-based coding will be uh, for this kind of stuff. But um, you can see that because it's able to join the server, it's just a client, so just like Max, just like pure data, just like a web interface. And it's pretty simplistic to get going. And I could show us some more detailed examples as we do breakout exercises in a bit. And one last thing I'll show you here that, yeah, if you do want to create a room from the Max patch, you would do that over here in Create Room. A uh, little pop-up window shows up for me here, but you may not be seeing it. But I'm going to type Max Room and Enter. And by creating this Max Room, I am now in it automatically. So if somebody sent something to me in Max Room, uh, it would show up here uh, for me if I had the uh, some module ready to go, or I could just receive that right from the server uh, and see that too. Click that details button there, Tony, in rooms. Yeah, go ahead, Eric. Do you want to walk through this? Yeah, I was just going to say that's one of the ways we've tried to make the the interface not too overwhelming is, you know, if, if we're always showing you all the rooms that are available and all the people that are in the rooms, it would be kind of too much to look at at once. So that's just a toggle. You can turn the details toggle on and off, whether, what, whether or not you want to see who's actually in those rooms or not. Mm hmm yeah, Otherwise, this by is default, a, you'll just see a list of the, the rooms that are available or the one the list of the names of the rooms you're in. Yeah, and this is another great example of Collab Hub being designed to give you the maximum, but there's very easy ways to tailor what you do and do not see, so you can only use it really when you want to. It's like how in, in Logic, Apple has it set up where like when you first install Logic, it looks like GarageBand, and you have to go in the settings and turn on all the advanced, or you have to go in the preferences right. and turn on all the advanced settings, and then it's like, Oh, wow, I can do all this other, sh other shit now. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so there's a great example of just um, sending stuff to rooms. Really, it just boils down to the messaging format, right? First, pick your model, push or publish. Then you can add your target. And this can be um, the room name, right? And then your control header, 
if it's a control message plus the data, or in this case, it was just an event. So I just gave the event header and that was it, right? Uh, and Nick, if I'm correct, right, you can also do room name and then space and then a user in that room, right? So you could add a third part to this message to say push uh, Nick's room. And then another target here would be like Nick Webb, right? And then- You would actually and... just swap it out. You, you could either pick a room as a target or the individual. So- Oh, right. You normally yes, you wouldn't true. combine it. You can just say, I want to send to Pedro or I want to send to all the people that are in Pedro's room. Right. And it wouldn't matter what room you're in, it would find you. That's right. right. Yeah. Thank you for that correction. Mm -hmm. Cool. So yeah, there's just basic room swapping so you can route data pretty easily. And Tony, this is the, um, uh, you didn't show the, sorry, that was in our paper when you showed the actual, like our, the Arduino. Oh, I, I can show that. Yeah. I, I can show that here for you really quick. Cause I have that up here. So, um, the Arduino script, right, is pretty straightforward, actually, which is nice. Now, again, we're using Collab Hub uh, as a wrapper around kind of the core features of Socket IO. Uh, additionally, in the Arduino side of things, because of all the JSON formatting for messages, we're also wrapping around a really helpful and well-maintained Arduino JSON library that'll parse JSON and, uh, and keep it pretty similar to the way you transmit things between the C++ environment of Arduino and the uh, JavaScript environment of the web. So really all that needs to happen here, right, is some standard Wi-Fi logon stuff. Right. Um, this code is a little bit outdated versus the one that I'm using. So uh, it was, you know, the username would be a bit different here, like ESP client nine or just ESP client. Um, you enter your own network and your own network password. I'm connecting to the hub namespace, but if I were to connect to a different namespace, like one for a specific piece or a concert, I would change that here. Uh, I'm pointing it at the global server, the CH server. Uh, .herokuapp.com address. Again, if you were doing a local version of the server, which we're hoping to experiment with uh, later on, you can point that towards your specific uh, you know, machine address instead. And yeah, this is modeled after a lot of uh, Arduino and web-based library processes as well, right? So I'm making an instance of the Collab Hub library. Uh, right here, there's some underlying kind of universal server type messages that we have to be able to parse with this callback event that I'm making right now, this callback uh, function. So I need to know if I get a disconnect message or a connect message. Um, I right now, actually, when I connect, I'm going ahead and I'm running a connect method, which just says connect to the namespace that I want. Then I'm sending my username right after I connect so I can change it, right? The server is going to give me a random one. I want to change it to something specific. And here's where I'm actually joining and creating the Arduino room, right? Right here, just by giving it a string with the name of the room I want to make. Um, when an actual event comes in, like an event header, a control header, a chat message, um, then I go ahead and I do a little more parsing. So I'm taking the entire payload that comes in, right, which includes, like Eric said, um, the message and all the metadata. Right now, um, I'm just looking for the event name. So I'm saying, hey, when you see an event name called event, as opposed to a control, go ahead and parse it further. And if that event happens to be called BAM, um, then I'm just toggling my light on if it's off or and toggling it off if it's on, just doing a little quick Boolean switch. So really, you're just writing some conditional logic here to say, okay, look for my events, look for my controls, then do something based on what type of event it is or what type of control it is. And if it's a control, you know, put the data towards the brightness of the LED or put it towards like the length of a musical sequence that's playing um, and so on and so forth. Yep. And then your traditional Arduino stuff here where you're connecting to the Wi-Fi during like a setup loop kind of like on an onload sort of thing with the web browser, uh, looking to parse the events with that callback. And then the Arduino actually works on a loop constantly. And all that I have right now in the loop is just watch the WebSocket data. If I was gathering stuff from sensors and then sending it back to the server, I would add that here into this loop to like read in data continuously and then format it and send it off to the sensor you know, continuously. 
yeah. So we're working on that Arduino library there, and that's going to be released um, by the end of the summer. So you all can play around with it and test it out. Get some web controlled uh, custom interfaces and instruments involved too. All right, so we got some other um, other demos in um, in the different platforms. Nick, do you want to go through? You had some uh, PD and a web based one, uh, or just a web based one? I have a. Let's do. Why don't we jump to the drum one? Why don't we do that? C uh, CH drum demo. Yeah. Well, so if you have the downloaded package, we have both a Max version, which we'll talk about first, and then we'll talk about the web version, which is. A, uh, an analog of what's happening in Max. So if you download the package, head to drum ch drum demo, and I will open up my Max patch. It'll hopefully load up in presentation mode. And in the upper portion, should I share my screen? Is it easier if I do it that way? Do it like that. Yeah, that'd be great, Nick. All right, cool. So in the upper portion, we have a, another version of CH client. And like Eric mentioned earlier, if you happen to have Tony's previous patch open, it's a good idea to close that just so that we don't have multiple client instances up. And uh, I might not have closed my other one. Let me, yeah, I did not. So I'm closing that one and then I'll connect back to the server, changing my name, Nick Max. And uh, this is a a quick demo of being able to control maybe someone else's instrument. So in the lower portion of this patch, I, I basically have a, a improvised drum machine that's just like filtered sound and, and sawtooth uh, waves. And you can trigger your own instrument. Uh, you can start the, the Max window audio driver and then should be able to hear the simple sound of the drum. And in and of itself, this is uh, your own local uh, instrument and you can change some of the presets. I have three presets that are available and you can then trigger for yourself. And so the example that of it being integrated into Max is let's say that I, everyone is connected. I want to control your drum machine. This upper portion, you can go and click on trigger and you can see that some people are doing that. The, the control other instruments, you can hit trigger or you can, and you can also change the variation of it. So you'll notice if someone hits three, all of our variations should be jumping to three. So the drum machine part of it is just there to show you that we can, tr can control multiple parameters if we map it in that way. And the, the way that I'm using it is that it's one, uh, value that's changing the variation linked to presets in Max. And so if we go to the web analog of this, uh, I will send the link in the chat. Basically it is, where is it now? Let's see, it is chserver .com slash whack dash drum. And you can keep your Max window open if you want to. And I'll, I'll throw this in the chat. And in this web page is very, very simple. Um, I'm running Tone.js with a very similar synthesis of what we have here. And since we're using web audio, of course, we need to enable audio. And then if you so choose, you can either do it in Max or in the browser, you can change everyone else's preset and then trigger their drum, right? So the controls and the interface don't look the same, but the, the, the functionality is very the same. I'm going to open up my um, ES code and just so that we can peek at how similar it is, right? And so at the start of this code, of course, if you inspect it, you can see the, I'm using the whack-controller.js. And it, the, just the way that the signal flow is, I have two sawtooth oscillators and uh, a noise, noise generator. And then they are driven by an amplitude envelope, each, all three of them. So there's two oscillators and then the noise and they have, uh, sort of, uh, they have an ADSR envelope that we can trigger whenever someone presses that 
that trigger button. And whenever someone presses the change, the, the preset, basically it sends, it just changes some of the, the frequencies of the oscillators and just the level of distortion. So functionally, it's the same, very similar to what's happening in Max. And we get a, a very similar experience. And this is all happening through Colab Hub. Um, some of this code looks a little bit different. <laughs> We're all having fun now, this is great. Uh, and you can choose to use whatever library, JS library, uh, this, I just happen to be using jQuery. I think in Eric's code that he demoed, he's using just a uh, regular JavaScript. Yeah, so that little bit, right, what is that line 63, that socket on event, that's that's what you're looking for. That was kind of like the, the really quick, like, um, the, the little bit that we added to the workshop this time where it's like implementing it in web audio that's the part where we're still sort of figuring out like do we need are we going to release some actual new package or do we just want to provide guides because you're really just looking for socket events to come in in this case it's looking for a control uh and whether or not that control has the value one two or three so that's mm -hmm. like to make a new to make your own web audio instrument that's uh that that's essentially how you're incorporating at this point is you're just adding the socket events to what to you know to your web application yeah cool uh what other demos should we do did you uh, did you have any others that were not max that were um, uh let's see uh mainly the other ones were max is everyone okay. do do does everyone else have max instances or downloaded we can do more web-based demos if we want it. Let's do a few more Max things, and then if we want to dig into some more web, we can. But um, cool. I think there's the waves? yeah, I think there's a couple in Max that address kind of what Pedro was talking about of like you know mapping questions and how do you get it so that it's not just like oh I'm sending a value that ramps up and it's ramping up some obvious parameter. How do you make some more you know interesting or dynamic mapping things? Um, one way that I've done that is the first way is kind of is oops sorry wrong window let me just show my all screen the first way that i've done that is really just like the idea of thinking about so in in that same uh folder there's something called ch telephone uh the ch telephone is not currently connected to um not currently connected to collab hub. so maybe late maybe towards the end if we have time to to try out some things and like work on some collective thing we can try to incorporate this but this is one where we are this is a super simple like essentially a lookup table right it's like if someone sends you the values from zero to 127 you know you can scale it or you can wrap it to something else so this was just like a sub module i put together for like i don't always want to be getting just values from zero to 127 from jeff or nick or tony maybe i want those values to be manipulated in some way. So I have a few different modes here for um, for transforming these values. And so this lookup table here shows you that, you know, instead of just getting zero to 127, I would have this, uh, you can see the output down here of what the resulting value is. So putting in from, so if you've got this loaded on your side, actually, I think I can, share my audio through it's not the most exciting sound it's just an oscillator but um oh i think i broke audio when i did that so let me not do that <laughs> sharing audio over zoom something worse than that okay anyway so the, this is like a, just a way at least to like change up when you get something to, to do something maybe not surprising, maybe kind of surprising with it, maybe a little bit uh, uh, just some way to transform the, the data as it comes in so there's not a simple one-to-one -one matter. So like in application where we would usually use this is um, I would stick this between the incoming data from one of the other people, Tony or Nick, 
stick this little sub module in between the input and the output, and then and then the actual parameter will go. That's usually what I would do with that. Um, this other example, I input is not my right parameter. Let's use the right parameter. When I was teaching last semester, I was constantly sharing my audio with the students. Is it still not my, it's not this? It says it is, that's so weird. Okay, let me try this again. By the way, with Max, if you want to share audio on Zoom, you can just like select the driver of Zoom on Max itself. Yeah, I, I have a fairly new computer, so I think I haven't installed like the Zoom audio device that I need. I think it's automatically. All right, I'm going to I'm going to leave and come back cuz I don't think it's recognizing my audio interface anymore. I'll be right back. Oh, Nick, which one would you like to show off in the meantime? Oh, good question. Let's do Why don't we go to visuals? So, if you've downloaded the Sounds package, great. go to visuals. And so we've used Collab Hub in our live performance uh and we have um, Anna in our performance group who, uh, who focuses on doing visual based performance. And we wanted to give in a little, little example of how we might do this. Um, you can, of course, close the other max patches that you have open and connect again. And uh, username is not too important in this one again. Uh, but we can use the, the point of this demo is that we can go to full screen and we can toggle through each of these images, pressing the different keyboard buttons on your number pad one through eight. And so if you, you can hit full screen on here and also open up your audio engine. And if you press some buttons, you should be able to send those values over to um, someone else that's connected. Tony, are you connected to the patch? Uh, there we go. OK. So if uh, Tony presses some buttons or somebody, numbers one through eight, we can have, we can trigger different types of events, right? Obviously, we're not sending the visual data the the files over the web but we're sending these triggering events to to be able to share some of these visuals of course there's different ways to be clever and you could probably figure out some some library that users can upload different images and then other users can trigger which ones get shown um, but this is a quick way to do this in max in that it's not just limited to just audio. Is cool. my mic better now? Yeah, sounds okay, great. Good. Sorry about that, guys. Uh, all right. So thanks for stepping in there, Nick. Uh, did you no have problem. something else to show in that one? I'll, I'll go back to that. No, no, no. I think we're good. Cool. All right. So the other one that I wanted to show that, again, I think addresses some of that mapping stuff is this one called CH Waves. And if you, again, if you have Max installed, go ahead and open this CH wave demo patch. Right. And I'll connect to the client. And you'll want to turn audio processing on. You should hear some kind of weird audio scrubbing sound when it uh, when audio processing is first turned on. So this this example here, this is a this is where obviously we are connected. If you click connect, you are actually connected to Collab Hub with this. And this is an extension of there was a piece I was working on about a year or two ago where I was taking um, physics based modeling. And instead of using it for synthesis, I was using it for control values. So essentially, this wave here is being processed locally, but we're sharing control of each other's waves. So when I move slider one on my wave, it's controlling 
my wave, but it's also sending slider one uh, to your wave and should be moving your waves as well. So we've got kind of a dynamic relationship here because since it's physics-based modeling, the outcomes are, you know, like I can start a ripple and it'll sort of cascade down and sort of play out in this, um, you know, not super complicated way because there's only 10 nodes to this wave, but in kind of a, an unexpected way, it's not linear anymore. And what I think is really interesting is we can have our physics behave differently on each other's computers. So I can go to my wave preset three, and now my wave behaves much differently than yours does if you're on one of the other presets. So I can send this control data to you, and the outcome of it on your patch will be very different than the outcome of it on my patch. And this is just behind, uh, if I unlock max, all that this is doing is each of these sliders, the value of that slider is playing back an audio sample. So obviously the outputs of these, um, I think they're, I have them going from, I wanna say it's negative one to one, is that right? No, zero to two. Um, the way that the physics model works, these are all going from zero at the bottom to two at the top. So you could map, you know, zero, this float value zero to two to, whatever you want in your patch instead of a you know playback location in a sample it could go to a, a, a filter cutoff or something like that um yeah i don't know i thought th i think these are fun because it's sort of like it's not actually physical obviously but it's physics based so we're sort of starting to bridge that gap of like you know when i see one of these sliders wiggle because somebody wiggle a slider i want to see a slider wiggle yeah, when I see one of these things wiggle, there's a little bit of a sense of like, I, I just get more of a sense of the presence, the remote presence of other people when I can see it played out this way than if it's just, you know, simply a value coming into a knob. I think there's something about this that starts to bridge that gap a little bit. Uh, and there's another sample in there. I just put in like a vibraphone sample too, if you want to play around with that one. But uh, again, those can obviously be mapped. Uh, the outputs of those, you know, 10 individual sliders can be mapped anywhere. Um, there is a little bit of, if you might have noticed, I'll show you real quick. I don't know, I, I can't remember, Nick, if you mentioned this or not, but if you look at the web interface, you can see that there is a, uh, a ping value in the upper right corner. So for me right now, in I'm in upstate New York, so I'm you know kind of on the East Coast, not on the East Coast, but near the East Coast. No, I'm not near the East Coast. I'm like hours from the East Coast. I'm in the Eastern <laughs> part of the United States. So I'm not that far from my, th we, we, we think the server that this is running on is in Virginia. So I'm not that far. So my ping currently is uh, in the 30s. Oh, just hit a 40. Um, and I assume I'm getting similar performance in max. I suspect that those of you that are in Europe are getting, you know, much higher pings. And even Tony and Nick, I think you guys even had, what, more like 50s and 60s from Wisconsin and Texas. So I'm only pointing that out because we, we I think having a server, having servers in different parts of the world can help improve this um, this ping time, certainly for different people. But also, when we perform, we're not trying to do anything rhythmically in time with each other. I think that also says something about this, this physics model. If you do, my, my own research into physics-based modeling is pretty minimal. Like, I can barely, I never took calculus, never took physics, so I can barely understand a lot of the papers. And one thing that's a huge priority in people who talk about use, using physics-based modeling for synthesis or for, for control values in music, there's a lot of emphasis on realism. Um, and one thing that you really need for realism is basically zero latency. Um, and, you know, like for example, if you're doing something with haptics where you can feel the force feedback of the model or whatever, it's really important that you basically have no latency. So I'm not at all purporting that when we're changing these values in this you know particular model here and I'm sending you that value, well, it's getting to you 100 milliseconds later, you're probably not getting it without some jitter, some timing jitter or whatever, because um, that's just the nature of, you know, it's just the nature of the beast. We're not trying to overcome those those issues. We're just kind of sort of like 
sitting with them and using them. And I actually think that's kind of like, when it comes to this wave in particular, I think that's kind of neat because I don't want the wave to behave exactly the same on your computer as it does on mine. If you get the timings a little bit differently than what I input into my system, that's part of I think what makes this kind of setup uh, interesting to me is that our outcomes will be a little different on each side, just like if we had two different acoustic instruments, you know? Um, so yeah, so we're, we're, we'll see what, what happens in terms of like putting out more servers or whatever with this ping time, but uh, you know, you, sh you should always expect, d don't expect that things are absolutely real time, obviously. We're, we're, we're not dealing with anything in the multi-second range, but so far things have been in the, you know, uh, My ping time is three seconds. Okay, I lied. Three seconds for you. <laughs> so again, also it's like killing, killing the browser. Like it's, uh, I think there's some debouncing issue or something. Like maybe it's just logging mm. too heavily, because I noticed that it does console logging, and that might be killing the performance yeah. a bit. That wave uh, patch in particular is sending a ton of values, especially if we're all connected at the same time. So that's something that we can look into as well as um, making sure we reduce some of that console logging or whatever. So, um, but yeah, so anyway, some of the, you can monitor your, your ping time in that uh, web application. And, um, but you know, we're not aiming for real time performance necessarily at this time. When we perform together, um, for ship of Theseus, and you know we're in four different states, three different states, um, and it's just kind of like you know it feels we're not playing anything rhythmic, we're playing more ambient uh, music, so it it feels like it's a live situation, even though there's some there's certainly some latency involved. We can't perfectly time gestures together, but we can at least have some some feeling of uh, interaction with this system. All right. Uh, other demo stuff, you guys. Nick, Tony. Tony, do you want to do your trader? Mm. Yeah, I'll show the sequence trader, and then this is just a kind of a build upon the rooms example we did earlier. Um, let me open that one up very quickly. Let's see here. Okay, close the waves example. So this one's in the demos uh, repo as well, and that one is uh, ch sequence trader. So I'll open that up here and I'll connect. Change my username here. Okay, and let me share my screen real quick. So similar to the way that um, Nick and Eric had their demos working as well, this has a local audio component um, and then is actually sharing control data to enhance or kind of uh, modulate somebody else's audio. Um, what we can do to kind of use this example together is once you've all connected, if you can all go here to the second submodule CH rooms and click on the green button that says create room and go ahead and create your own room name. Uh, so I'm going to create mine as Tony room. And when I hit enter, you should see that pop up as available rooms. I can see Pedro's room, Eric's room, very cool, very cool. Okay, Nick's room, great. Uh, and just like in the last patch, I have this set up so that when the re server receives a message, it's gonna send that to me saying a new room has been made. And I'm just monitoring those messages and I'm using them to fill a U menu. So I can always get an update on what rooms are available and I can choose that room within a room. I like that, very cool. So you can see that I've got all those options right here to choose from, to send a message. Um, the way that this little patch works here is you've got two sub modules over here in the middle of the patch. And then you've got a little basic B patcher here. That's just a very simple little drum sound. So you can turn your audio processing on and turn the gain up. And you can hear what this drum sound sounds like um, by going here in the orange box, your local sequence, and setting your tempo. Let's do something like that. Um, you can turn these toggles on in this uh, eight-step pattern. And then if you hit start or stop, mm -hmm. 
there's your simple sequence, okay? Um, now, the way that this one works here is that you can build a sequence and send it to somebody else to supersede the sequence that they're running, right? So for instance, what I can do is go over here and build uh, the same sequence that I built with mine over here. Bot two, three, bot two, bot, right that, okay? And that sequence is built up here, okay? Uh, and Max is actually sending it and packing it together into just a list of ones and zeros. And right now it's set up to send to Nick's room, but I'm gonna choose here to send it to Pedro's room. Uh, now when I do that, I wanna send the name first, just because of the way I have this patch set up. When I set the name first, it's going to rewrite the message I just sent. So I'll do this again here. One, one, and one, okay? And that will send on to Pedro's room and I'll say, send that sequence, okay? And now Pedro, you should have the same pattern that I have here on your drum machine. Yep, it sounds like he's grooving along to it. So I'll run my machine here and... Um... You all hear that all right through Zoom? Going in audio wise, okay. So if somebody wants to go ahead and send a new sequence to Tony's room, we should see this update in real time. Here the audio room. Okay, so there's, there we go. And anybody else wants to try it as well? We thought this would be a fun little example, particularly uh, thinking about Collab Hub and Max or Collab Hub and the web or any clients as an educational tool. Right, you can easily break off students and teach them basic rhythm examples or basic rhythm pedagogy exercises by having them make sequences for each other and send them around the room. Um, you kind of with different students. Or if you had multiple instruments, you can choose not just the person who's getting it, but the person's instrument that's getting it. Um, and things like that. We're not synchronized um, audio-wise, of course, across the planet as we all are here, but we are able to change each other's audio in our own little levels here through cloud. And I might and I get even change the beat division here between eighth notes and quarter notes. So the pattern stays the same, but the actual um, rhythm division gets changed somewhere. Awesome. Very cool. I'll send a different sequence. Here, send it to room in the room. So any questions on that example or again on the room sending or things like that? Pretty straightforward so far. Just so y'all know, we got some crazy storms just started up here. So. Oh, me too, Eric. That's weird. Me too. Here, it might be because the power went out. Um, yeah, we're getting them down here too. I think it's. it's... I, could, I felt the pressure change from inside. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I was going to point out in this, in this, both this and um, and like the wave demos, there, there. It's important to note that there's no, there's no timing or sequencing or clocking happening. Um, mm -hmm on the network. There's nothing happening in Collab Hub that's like trying to line everything. It's all about doing local synthesis and, you know, thinking about more than just sending continuous values to each other that map one to one to some other parameter. There's other ways to send things to each other, send each other patterns, send each other like, you know, behavior of a wave or something like that. There's other things that can be sent and um, I'm trying to remember who, what the name of the Oh, global string. So there is an example of like a Tao Tanaka and um, I forgot who the partner he worked with on that was. They did a piece called global string that was similar where like, especially back when they made this piece in, I want to say 2001 or so, uh, they could really only send low, um, you know, low fidelity control data over the, over the network. So part of what made, there were two locations that each had one end of a string in an in remote spaces. And so they weren't sending sound to each other. They weren't sending high fidelity control data. They were sending low fidelity control data that uh, initiated the same synthesis response in both places. So it's kind of like taking that load off of you know the network. Like we're not trying to align things in time on the network. We're just trying to provide um, 
ways for things to happen locally in whatever instrument or platform you're using. And it could be the same patch on both sides, or it could be different things. What kind of, um, uh, I guess, um, like, uh, what the name of it? Um, how do you deal with getting like uh, a lot of um, messages for the same address um, simultaneously? Uh, do you, do you uh, throttle? Do you have a way of like um, a way of choosing which one should go first, or do you just like take every message and just distribute it and uh, do it like that? It's it's a little of both, I think. Uh, I, I want Nick to say more about this, but I'll just mention that in the Max examples, I built it into the client side. Like there is some speed limiting happening on the client side there, just to make sure that uh, the messages aren't being sent too quickly. Um, and and I did some of that in one of the web inter web audio, uh, sorry, web instruments that I made as well. Was just like you know, the the one from yesterday where the audience was participating the speed limiting was happening on the client side there where people were moving the sliders, you know, the values were only being updated every hundred milliseconds or something like that. Yeah, on the server side, uh, I think that one of the design decisions that we made was that we didn't want to limit anything at the moment, mainly because we were sort of trying to purposely make it as open as possible. I think there's definitely arguments to making some smart decisions in different use cases. But at the moment, we are not um, purposely limiting or um, giving some messages higher priority. So it's first in, first out at the moment. Mm -hmm. Nick, did you have some other web audio stuff that you wanted to show? You mentioned that earlier. Um, I think that was it. The, the, Oh, you had okay, cool. Um, so, any questions about some of the demo stuff that we provided? Obviously, you're you're welcome to to reuse any of the stuff from the um, repository that we sent out. Any other questions about that? I think some smaller use cases that we didn't demo is that we, um, like Tony mentioned earlier, in, we're not sending or streaming video we have been successful of sending individual matrices, not very large ones, but I think like consistently you could probably send like a 32 by 32 uh, image, 32 by 32 pixel and do something clever with it if you wanted to. Um, anything more than that, we, we're running into things like uh, slowing down the, the bandwidth and stuff like that. But um, we, we have been experimenting with some larger data sets where it's 32 by 32, it's sort of medium size. Cool. So part of what we uh, had sort of wanted to do with the, with the last part of this workshop was look at um, potentially, you know, working with each of you, there's, one, there's three of us and there's three of you, so we could even split off one to one, uh, but wanted to look at some of the, um, uh, some of the ways that this might help do work with uh, with what you're currently doing and maybe like just come up with a quick example with each other. Um, you guys want to do that maybe as breakout rooms? Can we make breakout rooms? Maybe Tony, you might have that ability as the host. Yeah, it's a good question. Let me see. I, I, I can do breakout rooms here. Yes. So now um, I think there's actually, we have two participants. Xavier, of course, if you want to join us as well, but he may be away from his computer. So, um, Oh, that's who I was. I saw. Yeah. I so, was. so maybe Eric, do you want to try just having it kind of be a big group for now and see sure. how this works? And sure. then if we if we want to do other stuff and break our rooms, we can. But I do have that ability. I can do that from here. Okay. Just to check. No, yeah. I think you're right. Let's do. I I thought I didn't realize Xavier was Xavier. Yeah, he may not. I'm not sure, but but if he joins us, then that'd be good. Um, so Lewis, maybe we could start by looking at like with the the workshop that you're doing, and your platform. Can you? Um, maybe tell us a little bit about it and we can think about like how might these things interact with each other. Uh, well, I think um, one of the things that uh, uh, I was thinking about when, when you're showing um, 
collab hub uh, was a, like a, a kind of different aspect of the project, which is um, uh, this, uh, I guess it's an auxiliary pro project called Symbiosum and it allows um, basically different web applications to send uh, any kind of data between two different web applications. So you, for example, like if I was on the web application for uh, Collab Hub, I would um, be able to uh, use this library to send like the data between two different web apps host, hosted on two different domains. Um, and then, for example, uh, if I had a kind of web audio synthesizer, um, I could build some kind of um, custom control uh, event for that synthesizer that might not necessarily be zero and ones or whatever, but it just sort of is listening for data that uh, it re relates to that control event and um, maybe build an adapter or something to just convert the signals being sent from uh, from Collab Hub into uh, that, that system. Um, what I'm presenting tomorrow is uh, it would, the, the intention for that is to utilize something like that to enable streaming from the browser. So the, 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 the platform is just taking like packets of, uh, like it takes your stream of audio from whatever audio source you have, whether it's like a, um, like an input device or, or this sort of symbiosis thing. Um, and it takes, uh, it takes segments of that audio stream, encodes it into, uh, into like small, uh, uh, like encoded opus files and then sends it to a server. So the actual data that's being transferred is really small. Um, so people can get actual audio, but it, but it's with like, you know, the same amount of data that you use for like a standard data phone call, maybe a little bit more. Um, but it's all from within the browser. Uh, so then because it's all within the browser, you can have browser-based apps connect directly into it. So you can build yourself like a web audio synthesizer or some, something like that, and then just hook it up and then it will stream directly from your, your, your uh, instrument live to an audience. Um, the other inverse of that would be um, uh, to take audio that you're playing and then do something with it. So you might feed audio from, uh, from the platform into an instrument that's being um, uh, like maybe it has effects or something and you're getting signals from, uh, from Collab Hub changing the parameters of the effects that you're applying to the music. Um, there is another like additional part to it, which is that um, each, uh, each, so as I said, like the, the, the streaming platform uses uh, like, because they're files, right? It's encoding these segments of information. Do you know like Dash and HLS? They're like live stream pro protocols. They're used by, they're mostly used by video, like for live streaming video. Um, and this is, this is live streaming, not real time streaming, which two slightly different concepts. So um, with live streaming, you have these main protocols called Dash and HLS. And the, the platform I built is kind of like a stripped down version of that. Um, and the idea is that you're just turning instead of just say you've got your your streaming protocols that you use for collab hub and you're you're sending like packets of data constantly and the less like uh like a header data and stuff like that that's why you use um, socket io or whatever um uh, is better because it reduces the amount of time it takes to send a message um and it reduces the overall packet size and the old this other way it gives a content address to every single 
piece of data that's coming to you and the pieces of data are like seconds in length rather than you're really you're trying to like with real-time stuff you want to send as as small amount as possible as soon as possible with this you're it's more this concept of buffering so then latency becomes more relevant to what you're trying to do but because you have all of your data wrapped up in these like content addresses so uh, i mean like a, like a url basically so your file is just sitting on a server somewhere it's like you could use a cdn um which means it's it's a lot easier to obviously access the data um but it also means the data uh the value of that data is um consistent it's uh, uh it has a, a item potency item I rarely say this word. I usually write it like a, a item potency, I, item potency. Item, okay, item potency. Yeah, it means like when you when you send a request, it's like when you send a, it's like the you send a like a a put request. Item potency is like the standard. So whenever you send the request, you should always get the same thing back. So like so when it, so whenever you request this data, you always get the same data back, which means you can associate anything with that URL and get the consistent information, which means that if that URL is always there, then you can build things like a knowledge graph or whatever. Um, so the idea is uh, if you take, say, a stream of audio and you have the sequence of URLs that you're using, and then you take, say, the, the sequence of um, of uh, control signals coming from Collab Hub, and you can uh, you can uh, associate that sequence of control signals with each of these URLs. So then later, in you play back the stream, you can have your you can have a server that stores like a, a JSON of all of your control signals and download them at the same time. So you go like, give me the control signals for this audio block. Give me the next audio block. Blah blah blah. You would obviously buffer it if you have the ability to. So then you can basically replay exactly as you may have like performed it, but you could replay it with um, uh, like much less bandwidth requirements. Um, so obviously like being compressed audio, it's not like super high fidelity audio, but the point is that you're like, you, it gives you a lot more like versatility, I guess. Like, um, uh, yeah, if you if you don't have that much complexity to your music, but then your control signals give it a, a different sort of texture. Mm -hmm. um, uh, that's one way to explore it. And uh, the 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 idea more is like um, rather than. Uh, thinking about things in terms of a singular stream you know, you think about it in terms of like okay so if i it doesn't it's not relevant if you have um a stream of like single pcm stream right if it's, it's like whatever um and and for the most part that's that's good enough for a lot of people but say i wanted to stream audio from like a hundred different people now a hundred pcm streams it's like nobody wants to do that so if i have a hundred different audio streams and like a thousand different like uh people like also interacting with it that's when it starts to get interesting yeah so the design of the platform is mostly around my 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 ideas of like randomness um as i said like i'm pretty influenced by john cage and his views on like just using like sheer randomness and, and sound and, and just like playing with that and you get um, more interesting effects. And my theory is that the having humans at scale and combined with randomness is infinitely more interesting than most of the machine learning stuff today. And it's kind of like a, a response to that because I, like it's nice and all, but like I've worked in AI and I think, and my feeling is like, it's just, it's not that interesting. And um, and I think that like why I like Collab Hub is that it, you're, guy, you're trying to tap into that, this aspect of the of um, platforms in the internet that I, uh, 
I don't feel like people really caught on to before the whole machine learning craze took off, like, mm-hmm. especially like with the GANs and all, all like just, I don't know, I, I, I'm not really into it, but this is this, this other element of the, of, um, of uh, the internet and that's like doing things at scale mm-hmm. um, and, and the immersion effects that comes from when you have tons of people interacting with stuff that's why I was like, actually, like I was, I, I was the one that was trying to hammer your server before with the drum beats. And I actually did it last night as well. Cause I wanted to see if I like what sounds came out of that. And at one stage, I think I heard like the, like one of your controllers yeah. was picking up the, the hammering. Um, but, uh, and it was cool. Like it actually sounded really good. And, and I was like, oh, that, that they actually, it didn't just like crash their server um and uh yeah i really admire that I, I like when people explore these um these dimensions my only problem is like uh how to get people less interested in games that essentially are basically like you mentioned before about the the service do basically the same as like what multiplayer game servers do and i'm like mm-hmm. how do you get people less interested in like just spending their quarantine time playing games and like get more people um you know interested in this kind of stuff and and uh build a a big audience because i feel like this stuff really only starts to get interesting once you hit like the tens the hundreds possibly the thousands of people like and then you get like crazy you know chaotic effects happening um, and it also then tests your technology because like, you know, when you, when you're just like four, four people or whatever, you can only get like, um, you can only just build like bots to just like hammer your servers and do all this kind of stuff. And it's not really people, right. you don't know that like crazy effects. So anyway, sorry, I kind of rambled a bit there, but um, no, 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 no. I think it is interesting to think about that. Like you really do start to relinquish control the minute you ask people to get involved because <laughs> you can plan and plan and plan and try to have an idea of how it's going to work but then you you have to be okay with i think we sat for a long time with our performance leading up to our performance yesterday and thought about like well how will people react to this or like can we make it so that they do this and i think we eventually kind of all kind of settled on the idea of like we can kind of point things in a certain direction but whatever's going to happen is going to happen <laughs> with the audience interactivity um and it worked pretty well i think you know for what we got yeah i thought it sounded great thank you I like, yeah. and i like what you said about you know you were at some point you were like spamming the server and there there was not a there wasn't really a obvious one-to-one relationship of what the audience member was doing what the outcome was but there were a couple of times you were kind of like oh i think i made something happen and that sort of just like that, that's kind of i think what we were going for because we were really asking ourselves like you know all right this is been done before where someone gets a mobile interface you know they can pull it up on their phone pull up this interface and they can interact with the thing but what we really wanted is just that element of of surprise that element of risk of you know we've got all these controls coming in and we just have to map them to one of our controls and and let it go and the outcome of that was definitely different uh, i i can't quantify that but the outcome was definitely different yesterday compared to previous performances we've done. And I think it was just because we had one more element of, of human influenced randomness, I guess, uh, mm-hmm. you know, like, I mean, the, when, when we got 20 slider values coming in, we literally just took those slider values uh, and mapped them to a control, which means if one person sent a high value and the next person sent a low value, it was just constantly jumping between everyone's, you know, everyone's uh, incoming data, incoming control values. So yeah, it was like, in a way it was a sense of randomness, even though it's not. Mm. It was giving it the feeling of some sense of chan- uh, chance and randomness and risk without making it like, you know, you guys can all just crank all of our pitches or all of our filters up like that. Right. Ability was not there. Right. Uh, so yeah. Sleep shirt. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> I just saw your shirt now that your lights on. So. Yeah. I saw them live yeah. in Atlanta a couple years ago. Oh cool. Yeah, they're great. I don't think I've got anything other than just metal shirts, but um 
Yeah, it's interesting, like, uh, when I asked that question before about, like, uh, and you just sort of brought it up then with this this sort of jumping between signals, and um, it got me thinking about how how to, how to deal with stuff like that, like different, maybe having different algorithms to, uh, like on both on the server and on the client to deal with, um, uh, you know, this, I, like, it's one thing to be like the bouncing, but like, on the other hand, you know, sometimes it's m maybe more sensible to have a way of like, uh, maybe just picking like, two values like polling for values and then and then just lurping between whatever your current state is and the next state so um uh, there was someone um oh yeah so i was talking to the sound cool uh guy and um i don't know if you've seen that it's kind of similar idea basically um and uh and he was having a problem with the react framework not updating fast enough um to, to signals coming in and uh and it, it's a it seems like a similar problem where it's like um you're when you've got the push events coming through um uh, and this is basically like the main issue that like reactive programming is trying to solve which is like how do you uh deal with constant streams of incoming data. Um, and uh, I think that actually does play a huge part into the, like how uh, effective a system can be, because I think when you are dealing with a huge amount of streams and data is constantly changing and your even your audio engine can't perceptibly like update, like at a rate that makes it sound like uh, something interesting. Mm -hmm. like, and this is something I found with, with building Revalium is like the, you know, the, you have this trade-offs between how quickly you want audio to, uh, to change or whatever, because um, sometimes like the, you, you can end up with a, an overriding, um, aesthetic that every piece ends up just sounding the same because your 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 platform your system can't really uh get away from this just constant fluctuating range of sound like si signals it's getting and like you're saying before you kind of get to choose like when you're performing you're choosing how much of the signal you want to use and that kind of thing but like if every time you switch on like i want to get audience participation and you're and your you know synth is just going like that and you're like ah oh, i don't it's like it's not the sound like it's just a square wave like every time and it's like right. you know even square <laughs> waves get tedious mm -hmm. um and and that's uh one of the most interesting things i think that's come out of um exploring these things is like you know the it's like the theory like man randomness sound, must sound really cool and then you like do like math.random and feed it directly into your buffer and it's just like and you're like yeah it's interesting for about five seconds and right then, yeah. um, it's all in context yeah exactly and uh, yeah and then it's like um the choice of like well, actually the one of the more interesting things i found is like how many times you can feed one signal into another another signal so you instead of like saying well everything gets treated equally it's more like you use certain values to play a part in an overall like algorithm of how like each signal affects another one. So as I was saying, like you might just like linear, like use linear interpolation between two different signals mm -hmm. and just poll for a new, like you, you, you get your stream and you're discarding like every 10 milliseconds worth and you're just, just interpolating between the two. Um, uh, and I think most people won't even really notice the difference or the other thing would be like, you might take a bunch of like chunks of that stream and then use like certain amounts of that data to then just augment the other parts of the data that you have. So then it's kind of like basically a PD patch or a max patch or whatever um, within the actual data itself. So it's kind of like 
one ones like if you don't want to actually like truncate any of the stream or throw any away you just take a sequence and just to, like you know you might you a simple way is just sum them together or you might like pass them yeah, as like a blobs. bunch of yeah yeah but um yeah it's just it's it's interesting experimenting but the other thing is like how do you you know uh take all of these different possibilities and make it make them op options explore them test them and all that stuff without overwhelming your code base and stuff and mm -hmm. um that's that's where i'm currently at with a lot of things like a, like a lot of requests to like control this and that and it's like uh, i'm not going to build that because it's not going to help you i can guarantee that but um but at the same time it's like yeah, yeah, yeah. um yeah, it's like it's interesting just seeing like what as what what you've chosen in Collab Hub to be like the focus. So like you've got like zero zero and ones, and you've got like a like a like a a vector, and um and uh, you know there's there's plenty of other possibilities, and I mean you don't even need to just use numbers, but um, that's the main language of of. Uh, of max right zeros and ones and a range between zero and one um but uh you could use anything you know smiley faces and the text to interpret it and that kind of stuff but um yeah, there's definitely a lot of there's a lot of uh, uh responsibility on the the musicians the participants mm -hmm. in this case we're really you know i mean some of the other um platforms that we, i've seen recently that were made for something like this were sort of like, well, here's a set of instruments you can use within PD or whatever to talk to each other. So the instruments were kind of already made. And so a lot of those decisions were made for you. And I think we still want to think about that balance of like, you know, like, like we said, we wanted this to be an approachable tool. So we can't leave it so open that nobody knows what to do. But we also, I think we've benefited a ton from the fact that we all have different, completely different instruments in our setups. Uh, completely different processing, and we don't, sort of don't really know what each other is doing. Um, and there's no, there's not a whole lot of plan. Like occasionally, we would like Jeff, the other guy who's part of this performance, that's not here today. He, he would say, "Okay, can, Tony, you're controlling my filter cutoff." And I don't know, Tony, do you? How much are you thinking about that while you're, while you're changing? Jeff's controls. You know, it depends because if that is, that to me is a very direct specific thing, right? Like it's not like he's, uh, that control feeds into something like a leaky accumulator kind of algorithm where like the more I move it, maybe it'll like increment up or something. Like, because I know I can hear that hearing Jeff's synth, I know exactly what that's going to do. And I think about it a bit more because I'm like stylistically or musically, if I, you know, increase, open the filter, and I'm going to increase the brightness right now on this line. Is that going to clash with something somebody else is doing, you know? But if it's something different, like I can imagine on my looper changing the window size, y'all can't really see my window size unless I'm broadcasting my buffer like waveform viewer, right? So that is a little more haphazard. And I'm not sure maybe you think about that more or less, um, because you can't hear or see a completely direct analogy to what you're changing. I think there's, I think there's definitely a mix. We're sort of trying like, even though each of us has our own instrument because they're tied to each other in some ways they form sort of a meta instrument of some kind. And, and to have the bandwidth to have the state of everybody's instrument in your mind, is just not really possible. So there's some like just giving up to like, I'm sending Jeff these controls. I can't remember what they are mapped to. So let's just see what happens. Um, one thing that happened a lot during yesterday's performance in particular, my, why don't I just open this up real quick. My, uh, the performance patch that I use um, is, oops, it's going to be all broken because my file references are not set up correctly. But basically what, I, I have like 10 controls at any one time that I can have, uh, probably not even 10, but I can either map to someone else or have them, their incoming data map to on my end. And I actually ran out at one point. There was one point where I was like, I can't assign any more incoming control data because I've already used it all up. And so what happened was I would kind of double up. Um, so if Nick's 
incoming data to me was controlling my delay line length, that same exact value, aside from also controlling my delay line length, was going out to Anna for her light. Because it was just a point where I was like, I can't, I have nothing else to map uh, things to. So I just had to sort of like almost create this, it was, certainly wasn't a loop, but there was a little bit of a telephone thing going on where his data was coming into me doing one thing, and that exact same data was being passed right on to Anna and it was doing something different in her, uh, in her setup. Um, and yeah, it was just like, okay, that's just the way it's going to be. We're not going to have to. We're not going to deal with like, uh, ex like you said. There's just there's too much. When there's too much going on, you sort of have to give up a little bit to, um, uh, not to the randomness, but you know, just give up a little bit of, of that that control and the surprises uh, that come out of that are part of what's interesting, I think. And and ideally, with you know, even more people more than just uh, what we've got. Um, Pedro, did you, uh, you said you were primarily a Max user, is that right? Yeah, basically. <clears throat> Sorry, I can hear you. Not yet. <clears> oh. <throat> so? Okay, now, yeah. Oh, that was weird. All I had to do was toggle my mute button. It didn't show as muted, mm. but <laughs> off and on. Um, I was just curious what uh, what some of the work that you're doing in Max right now, like, and some of the mapping struggles that you're dealing with. Like, what what kind of things are you working on? Well, I'm not I'm not dealing per se with like mapping struggles or anything like that. Actually, I guess the barriers that I encounter is mostly how can I make the data from go to from one place to another and like then amplify it from a local network because i had this piece as well like for ensemble and uh each performer had an interface on an ipad and it would be sending messages just like with buttons like with bangs to either invite them to play with someone or stop playing or something like that very simple but of course it was very slow because i was using um what's it called mira web with max and it's hella yes. slow and hella low fidelity crashing all the time. The recording session was great. My computer crashed three times. <laughs> um, but then of course, I also had ideas of expanding this idea into a more worldwide setting. And then like, okay, how the hell will I do that? Which is quite nice to actually show, show this tool because yeah, it just really solves that problem. Like a bunch of problems that I had in my head as well. And implementation on the uh, on the web is so easy that uh, yeah, I really need to get a, a look into that. But yeah, my problem is not so much with the uh, mapping because that's not something that that I particularly focus on actually. But it's I mean it's always interesting to get perspectives of people who work with that because I've been doing some reading and some research like mappings as well. Because I think it's a part of internet-based um, art is how we retrieve or how we treat the information that we retrieve from someone doing something on some whatever. So yeah, <clears throat> I don't know. <laughs> a little bit so anticlimactic. This piece that you're talking about with MiraWeb, uh, it was like a like a kind of like an ensemble piece. Like yeah. An ensemble. Yeah, that was they were. Did they each have the same, like processing or or synthesis or? or did they Actually, there was no synthesis because I was basically using Max for communication, which is like ironic because it's Max like it's audio based. Mm -hmm. Well, not audio based, but anyway, I was just using it as an interface to like transfer information. I was like, yeah, because they had their iPads, for example, and they're like six people connected to my own network. And then when they press the button, it would go to my computer and then like go to someone redirect. And then at the same time, from time to time, I would have to send a picture to all of them. But the thing is, I had to send the whole information of the picture and it took like, I don't know, four or five seconds or it just didn't arrive, could also happen. So like, yeah, so like I was also encountering the problem. Okay, but maybe asking them to have the patch in their computer is a little bit too much or something like that. And then, yeah, I'm just, yeah, there was no, no particular sound thesis. I, th I think it's one of the only pieces that, of mine that I really don't use electronic sounds, which is quite interesting, um, but yeah. So is this the kind of thing where with 
the web interface that we showed today is is that already something that would accomplish what you're trying to do? And yeah, for sure. That's for sure. Yeah. yeah. And a whole bunch of like the previous piece that I talked about of uh, of uh, uh, people writing on 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 Twitch. Like I, I really want to get away from that because I want to have like let's say my own website and like people say, oh hey, I would like to perform this piece and I'll get okay. Here's the link. Go ahead, have fun, do whatever. Um, but yeah, like really creating that setting is the part that I'm not able to do because I have no knowledge in coding in browser or something like that, like zero knowledge. And it's quite a, a little bit daunting for me, actually. Um, <clears throat> yeah, because I don't do fine with lines of code. That's why I gave up on learning Super Collider. I just don't do mm -hmm. well with it. It's so abstract. No, no, thank you. Um, it's really weird the way that things, uh, like, when you're younger, your mind is usually more plastic. And so I'm surprised, you know, I'm surprised at, I'm going to be 40 this year, so I'm kind of surprised at how this kind of work is, is still pretty new to me, right? Like, mm -hmm. I wasn't, I didn't write any JavaScript until last, well, about two years ago, right? Mm -hmm. So there's definitely a sense of, like, as you... Uh, as you come to different different times in your life, there are different times where certain tools, are, it's almost like when you see the application, it sort of presents itself. And a lot of that was actually because of Node for Max, because of the fact that Max suddenly had uh, uh, was running Node, Node natively. I was like, okay, <coughs> I can see some applications for this. And mm -hmm. then suddenly I was writing JavaScript using Node, and then I'm now I'm you know doing it in the browser with, with um, some of the instruments that we've been using for Collab Hub. Um, but at the same time, like I still spend most of my time in Max, and like you, I gave up on Super Collider years and years ago. Like, <laughs> I mean, I know people who use it and do great stuff with it, but I remember yeah. trying to learn it once over spring break, I don't know, 12 years ago, and I was like, yeah, that's all right, I'm good. Yeah, I had a class on it last year, and just like gave up midway because I was just not really accompanying the class at all. Mm -hmm. I mean, the teacher was great, this Icelandic person, but no no thing i just wasn't able capable to uh capable to follow the whole thing yeah you know it, it could be very interesting then when um we are bringing you know uh more of this as a, a sdk i guess or like a library for the web side of things to see what we could do similar to the sub modules maybe to make some graphical little uh modules that also come along with some javascript uh into the web right to sort of say like put these as a template into your patch and it gives you a text field that you can write into and it had to send this stuff off to the server isn't that, if isn't that what nexus was at some point the idea behind yeah we the three of us eric nick and i went to lsu where there was development on this process called uh, nexus louisiana, which is now louisiana i think state university oh yes yeah sorry louisiana state university um that was called nexus osc is now nexus osc uh, and the idea was to uh, try and kind of start some of this stuff of simplifying web development. And what it came became out of that was um, UI objects. So I think it was Nexus UI first, Nick, is that correct? And now it's Nexus OSC. So you can go and you can right. make some very simple sliders and dials and buttons or a uh, keypad, oh, sorry, a keypad, a, a piano keyboard um, so that you can simplify making a musical performance. You still have to tie that to a web audio engine or an API that simplifies the web mm -hmm. audio um, engines like Tone.js. So you still do need to know some of that coding because otherwise these things are just click and drag and touch. But it could be interesting to maybe combine those two processes, right? That the Collab Hub web library is kind of like the max modules where you can copy this into your browser and it's here. And as long as the browser page starts, everything else you can do is just typed into that module and you don't have to add more coding uh, if you don't need to. You know, And if you really don't want that on a web page, if you need to hide that, then you can just do some of these lines of codes, which are like the next step of it. Yeah, thank you, Eric, but the next that's is a, JS. Um, I yeah. believe this is it. Let me just triple check this. And that's kind of the, yep. the purpose mm -hmm. of that is to simplify interface uh, development for web-based instruments or just web-based controls. Um, so it might be, yeah, it might be something where we look into sort of incorporating some of that into, at the very least, our documentation for Collab Hub, or maybe, maybe there's a tie-in. I'm not sure how. It looks like this 
Well, this was updated 10 months ago. It's not that far out of date. So mm -hmm. somebody might still be maintaining this. I think it's Ben Taylor has taken it over in the, um, at least the last couple of years that I've been using it. Yeah, Ben Taylor started, I think he is continuing to work on it. Mm -hmm. So so that does bring up an interesting point, right, of features in just this examples that we talked about today and kind of this, this open workshop here. Are there features that the two of you have kind of thought or, or have run into? I know you've kind of already mentioned like Pedro, Mira Web seems at times almost unusable for some things, right? I mean, Lewis, you've brought up some things that you were testing out in the performance yesterday or things that you've been running with your own elements. Are there things that you don't see here that we've talked about that you think would be good to include? Things that you think could be useful for um, yourselves and other users who are working in this realm? Maybe I'm thinking about mostly on the web um, version. Well, I, I'll probably just use Max with this because it's like, it's nice home, has a nice warm bed for me. I like it. Um, if I can go with Max, I'll use it. But maybe on the web it would be interesting to have maybe other kinds of UI, op UI options. Because like you have, you have a slider and like maybe you have a message, but maybe it makes more sense to have an XY field or whatever, you know? Um, or several versions of a um, GUI or, or UI or something like that. Like instead of having a slider, then you have like a, a dial thing. Because for each person, it's like, it's also quite interesting because each person creates their UI, their image. So if those possibilities are there, it can connect even more on a spiritual level with what they're seeing in front of them. And which I think, which I think is very interesting in terms of creating your own instrument or using other people's things, you know, this flexibility and malleability of how you create and it becomes more personal is what I want to say, maybe. I don't know if it's relevant, um, but could be, could be interesting. Definitely. Yeah, I agree that, with that. That, that, oh, sorry, Nick, go ahead. Go, uh, yeah. I think that we, the three of us have definitely thought about those things. And like Nexus was like one of the early projects that when I was in at Louisiana State, like they were working on. And like, I, I think we've all like used some version of, of touch OSC um, to, to use as controllers. And I think that would really be nice if we incorporated a, a, a possible library that users could use for Colab Hub so that you can drag and drop uh, some UI elements and then put some preset values and mappings that can be sent out. And is there MIDI mapping on the web? Not at the moment, uh, but you're the, the second person that said, that's mentioned that. So like, that's definitely on our list. Yeah. Cause like it's the action of going with the finger to the mouse. It hinders a lot of other actions and also polyphony in terms of parameter sending, mm, which yeah. I, I think as musicians, I think it's quite a maybe that this to me is quite an important thing that your index finger can do something and your, your, your pinky can do something else. Mm -hmm. Could be also, also also interesting in terms of interfacing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the web um, MIDI API is really robust and it works really well. So I, I think that would be a good place for us to explore working that into a future collab of web API of some kind of, of you know being able to bring that in. Just plug your MIDI controller in and make sure it's connected and then go send messages, right? Like this key sends uh, to the web send, but then also on to the server and onto your other connected clients. Yeah, exactly. Thank you. Yeah, those are great thoughts. <laughs> if you say I've got so. some notes for some feedback from you guys in terms of, uh, you know, where we can take this in the future. Um, as I mentioned at the start of our, our, our meeting here, the the client for Max and PD that was part of the download uh, for today's workshop is not the maintained version. So just make sure you actually go to our regular uh, repo for that. And all the, all the links are in there. Um, but if you want to keep using the Max client or, or Lewis, if you want to try that, the PD one, just make sure you keep up to date with that other one, uh, the actual released version. Um, our site, you know, our regular website has our link for the newsletter to sign up for that, which obviously will announce um, upcoming releases. Probably the next couple of things we'll have. Uh, Tony, you're pretty far along probably with that Arduino stuff. So that's probably coming out pretty soon. Um, yep, that'll you know, be coming out soon. 
if there's other platforms that you're that you're interested in that you think should be um, should be included here. Um, Nick was talking about doing some touch designer stuff, and we also just want to make sure that regular plain old OSC is available, um, since you know like digital audio workstations also support OSC, so it could be a way to. Um, I don't know that I would do a network piece using like Logic or Ableton, but if, you know maybe. Um, but yeah, certainly keep in touch with us. If you join our Discord, that's probably the easiest way to you know just send direct messages for Nick. I know is on Discord like every day, so. <laughs> you know, well, probably multiple times a day, right, Nick? Yeah, I'm in there all the time. I check in once in a while, but certainly, you know, <laughs> if you want to uh, check in with us there, one of us might be, Nick will probably actually actively be in there if you have a question, or if you just want to leave us some feedback or comments there, you could do it at Discord, you could do it in the GitHub repo. Um, but yeah, any other, I think we're about out of time. Any other questions, you guys? I just want to thank you for this. It was great. Very nice uh, tool. Grandiose work. Amazing. Yeah. Thank I feel like uh, a lot of clouds in my mind just went away. Hey. Which is very nice. Yeah. Very nice. Well, thank you. Yeah. And like, and like Eric and Nick have said too, you know, we're open to, if you're starting a project and you have questions or you'd like to work with us to do stuff like uh, custom namespace, anything you think that you could use for your project, we, you know, please feel free to reach out to us. I'll go ahead and I'll drop our emails into the chat. Although they, I think they are also available on the, the PDF that you downloaded uh, or you can download from the web audio um, uh, website as well uh, for this mm. workshop. Okay. One thing, one thing that would be awesome is if there was like a, like a web component set or just a tool that um, made it really easy to import the library and just like, call a function where you can plug the a uh, a signal directly into a um into whatever like if i just have if i'm just like waiting for a function to be called or something i couldn't quite see maybe i missed it but um having something like very straightforward like that and just a, like a few examples of how to implement that that would be like super useful because like uh uh, I like building um, like synths in the browser and I like being able to just connect to some remote server and control a synth like remotely, like as painlessly as possible. I think when, when uh, running a workshop and demonstrating it, especially with like younger people and just like, a, a, I don't know if you saw the web audio XML project, but they, uh, they made it make it really simple to just build like um node chains and connect them to uh connect them to uh interfaces without actually having to tie the interface into the the xml stuff that they have and if it's as simple as that is just having a, a block of xml or something and just referencing a variable or or or, or a function name um that would be uh awesome definitely Yeah, that's great. I think we're all taking notes. We're, yep. We've written all this stuff down, yeah. Cool. All right, guys. Thank you again. Um, our emails are there in the chat and um, Discord, GitHub, etc. cetera. Um, thanks for hanging out. Yeah, yeah thanks. Excellent. Yeah, enjoy the rest of your time at the conference, y'all. You too. Thanks. thanks. Thank you, guys. Bye. Ciao. Thank you so much. Ciao. Bye-bye.